Good afternoon, everyone. I will look to call the 10th meeting of Civic Works to order. I uh, wanted to start first by saying that for those that are uh, looking, you can check the city website for additional meeting detail information. Meetings can be viewed via live stream on YouTube and the city website. The city of London is situated on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenapowek, and the Attawandran. We honor and respect the history, languages, and culture of the diverse indigenous peoples who call this territory home. The city of London is currently home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit today. As representatives of the people of the city of London, we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and live in this territory. The City of London is committed to making every effort to provide alternate formats and communication support for meetings upon request. To make a request specific to this meeting, please okay. contact CWC at london.ca or 519-661-2489, extension 2425. With that, I'll move on to item one, any disclosures of pecuniary interest. Seeing none, uh, I wanted to acknowledge uh, our committee members that are here in the room. Uh, nice to see you all today. And also wanted to acknowledge visiting councillors that are both uh, here in the room. And I see Deputy Mayor Lewis and Councillor Hillier uh, are also online. Uh, we'll move to item number two, which is the items for, for consent. Um, I have not received any communication from members of the committee to pull any items. Uh, is there anyone looking to pull anything at this point? Okay, seeing none, I'll look for a mover and seconder for the items for consent. And then I do know that staff have some additional comment for item 2.6. Looking for a mover and seconder. Councillor Cuddy and Councillor Van Meerbergen. And before we vote on that item, um, we'll go to item for item 2.6. Uh, I'll go to um, Ms. Ramelou, if you wanna provide any additional comment uh, around that report. Sure, and thank you through the chair. So as committee may be aware, we are currently working on the rehabilitation of Springbank Reservoir number three. So this reservoir is one of several in our water supply system, and it's critical for ensuring proper flows for drinking water and fire suppression. It's also used as storage in case of an interruption in our water supply from either Lake Huron or the Elgin area systems. So when the reservoir was drained, it was found that there are significantly more repairs needed than were identified during the inspection and included in the contract price, hence the ask today. So it's important to understand that the original inspection was completed while the reservoir was in service, so it was full, and there is an inspector in a boat in the dark uh, with a flashlight trying to count those needed repairs. So, um, and there are a large number of a particular type of repair that simply couldn't be seen until the reservoir was drained and scaffolding was set up. As a side note, I, I was in there last week. I have some really cool pictures for anybody who would like to nerd out with me about it. Um, but so it's... Uh, that said, without completing these additional repairs, uh, we would expect the deterioration to continue and potentially accelerate, ultimately risking the structural integrity of the roof. However, uh, completing these repairs while the reservoir is drained um, and the contractor is on site is expected to leave the reservoir in excellent condition and in service for another 60 years. So it's, we highly recommend this uh, investment. Thank you. Do I have any questions on that item? Um, I know that there's additional questions on item 2.1 uh, as well. Um, before I go to Councillor Pribble for item 2.1, um, I did want to mention very quickly that within the report from uh, ITAC, they provided some recommendations um, and there was going to be further conversation with them uh, as those recommendations, as my understanding, uh, need to be approved by the whole committee. So there's an opportunity for staff to have a follow-up discussion as there's some challenges within those recommendations that would need to be sorted out um, uh, before they come forward. But I will go to Councillor Pribble on item 2.1. 
Thank you, and through the chair to the staff, I just noticed uh, when I was reading through the reports, the ICAC the recommendation for Dundas Place is asking the city why is it closed on a uh, temporary basis or not the permanent ones. And I just want to make sure, I don't know how the correspondence goes between the ICAC and our staff, but I just would want to make sure that we do consult with the businesses there on Dundas Place well in advance, potentially we move, try to move this forward because there are some that uh, this is the only diver, delivery option for them. So I just want to make sure that we do it well in advance. I don't know if the staff has any comment. I would appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dan? Yes, and through the chair, um, this year Dundas Place is currently in a traffic diversion status, which we've had for the last three years, and it's meant as a construction mitigation because we have road closures and lane restrictions on some of the surrounding streets. What it prevents is people using Dundas Place as a cut through for cut through traffic. It makes it a safer environment for some of the patio activity and, and activations that happen. It also is a key cycling spine through our core. So for this year, it is really still a temporary construction mitigation that's in place. There is a review that's underway that I understand should be done near the end of the year that's looking at options for whether that's something to continue in the future or if there's other ways to be able to activate the Dundas play stretch and businesses in that area will be consultant through that process. Thank you, follow-up, Councillor? No more follow-up, thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any com comments, any further comments or questions on the consent items in front of us? Okay, seeing no, none, we'll open the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Thank you. With that, we'll look to move on to item number three, scheduled items, and item 3.1, uh, which is the uh, Blackfriars Bridge, the long-term use. Uh, before we open the public participation meeting on this item, um, I'd like to give staff the opportunity to do their presentation in order to help provide everyone with background and framing, and then from there we'll open the PPM. Mr. Dales, thanks. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, the Blackfriars Bridge was built in 1875 and is one of the oldest and rarest bridges in Canada. An environmental assessment was completed in 2016, which resulted in the reconstruction of the bridge <clears throat> and then was subsequently completed, which was completed in, 20, in December of 2018. In response to to part two order request to the environmental assessment, the Ministry of the Environment required that the city study traffic patterns on the bridge within five years after reconstruction. During the pandemic, the bridge was temporarily closed to facilitate physical distancing. At the end of that brief period in November of 2021, council directed staff to complete this usage study and provide a report to council. The bridge serves multiple functions and is a cherished heritage feature and a neighborhood landmark. The current layout was determined through the environmental assessment process and based on consultation at that time. The bridge currently carries one-way eastbound vehicle traffic and accommodates eastbound and westbound cycling. A sidewalk is located on the south side of the bridge. The number of vehicles using the bridge is much less since the conversion to one-way traffic. The posted speed limit is 20 kilometers per hour. The average daily volume of motor vehicles and active transportation, those walking and cycling on the bridge, are approximately the same. The details of a traffic report completed by Dillon Consultant are available on the project webpage. In summary, the bridge accommodates all users reasonably based upon current volumes. The volume of cars is relatively low when compared to other neighborhood connector streets in the city. The traffic modeling that has been completed indicates that rerouting of cars from Blackfriars Bridge <clears throat> to the
to the parallel routes of Oxford and Riverside has a minimal impact on overall traffic operations. It's also uh, noted that there have been no collisions since the bridge was reopened. The details of the public survey, which were completed by the Heal Lab at Western University, are also available online. 1,200 people responded to this survey. 61% of those respondents identified active travel as their primary travel mode, and 20% identified motorized travel as their primary mode. The survey results also indicate that most users feel safe when they're crossing the bridge. Three options were developed for evaluation and consideration by Council. Option one is retaining the current bridge configuration based on the satisfactory operations and improved active transportation and neighborhood con conditions that result from the low traffic volume since the one-way reconfiguration in 2018. This option retains all connectivity between the Blackfriars neighborhood and downtown and provides a level of road work redundancy, roadway network redundancy, sorry, for drivers to access downtown during construction, during unanticipated events and closures, <clears throat> or special events. Option two would dedicate the bridge to walking and cycling during the warmer months by prohibiting car traffic from May 1 to October 31st annually. This timing aligns with increased use of active transportation on the TVP and in nearby parks. Option three would dedicate the bridge to walking and cycling for the entire year by extending the motor vehicle prohibition to a permanent year-round condition. Based on the work that we've done and completed, we consider that all options are feasible, but given the unique nature of the bridge as a heritage asset and a neighborhood feature, the desires of the community and the results of both the technical and public survey are very important as part of this process. We're recommending that option two, which is a partial year restriction to motor vehicles, be considered <clears throat> as a measure to support healthy lifestyle during times of higher active transportation use while facilitating all modes of mobility, including driving for the remainder of the year between November and April. This change is recommended to occur beginning in 2024 when construction related traffic disruption in, in and around the downtown will be significantly reduced and connectivity on other routes improved. Subject to Council's direction on this matter, staff would report back to the province to satisfy the EA conditions of approval. We would also finalize any details of a barrier or gate system and provide notice to residents and bridge users regarding this change. As mentioned, this configuration would be implemented in 2024. Thank you and happy to, uh, to take any questions. Uh, thank you. So before we uh, open the, look for a motion to open the PPM, are there any technical questions in nature for staff? Um, if not, we'll address non-technical questions after uh, the public have had a chance to speak. Uh, Councillor Chasso. Thank you very much. Um, welcome to everybody who's here for this, for this meeting and through the chair. I would like to uh, ask some questions and I'll, I'll try to keep this to technical um, questions. Um, you, you, you indicated that there would be no effect on current traffic patterns um, under any of the options. Could, could you elaborate on that? Because uh, it, would, it, would, it would seem intuitive that if you close the bridge to traffic all of the time, that's going to push traffic someplace else, and that would have an effect. Thank you, Mr. Dales. Thank you. Through the chair. So the, uh, the traffic study that was completed indicated uh, a significant reduction in, in traffic using this bridge since it was converted uh, to, to one-way traffic at about 1,000 vehicles per day, which is a relatively uh, low volume for this street classification. Uh, so the analysis that was done through the, the traffic study indicated that uh, reassigning that traffic to our major routes such as Oxford and Riverside uh, uh, resulted in uh, very minimal impacts to overall traffic operations.
thank you. That, that's, that's, that's helpful. Um, I, I note that the report says that there were no collisions. Um, is, is, it, is it possible or likely that that is an underreporting of collisions? Because sometimes when collisions are minor and nobody is hurt, both parties agree it's just best to uh, go on their way. Uh, Mr. Dales? Through the chair, uh, so the um, the information that's provided in the in the traffic study uh, related to collisions would be uh, for re uh, reported collisions. So those would be situations where uh, folks would either uh, the police would be involved and, and a collision port report would be uh, available, or um, folks would be, would be reporting those collisions at the uh, the, the collision reporting center. So. Uh, does raise a good point in terms of there, there may be unreported collisions that aren't uh, reflected, but um, that's uh, typical of our, our reviews in terms of using uh, information that is available from, from those sources. Thank you. Follow-up, Councillor? Yes, also through the Chair. Um, we have no way of knowing about near collisions where there were, were possibly skid marks and uh, maybe somebody swerved, but there was no, there was no contact. Is that correct? Mr. Dales? That's correct. So we certainly don't um, speculate in terms of near misses or, or, or collisions in, as part of this analysis. So this is uh, the work that's been done. The, um, the data that's been collected is based on, on collision reports that would be uh, completed by the police. Thank you. Any oh, further comments? Yes, I'll, I'll just ask one more and I, I can come back to this um, la later. Um, in, term in terms of the recommendation to allow vehicles during the winter months, did the study make? Did the study make any attempt to uh, consider uh, the phenomenon of winterized bi bicycling and how that is growing in London? Were, were, were any questions asked about winterized bi biking? Were were, were vendors, uh, bicycle uh, shops, asked about uh, the prevalence of studs uh, on 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 wheels? Was any attempt made to sort that out? Mr. Dales. Through the chair, uh, as part of the um, the public survey, there was a question related to seasonal use of the bridge, but not specific to the type of vehicle or type of uh, cycling uh, activity uh, that may occur during the, the winter months. So, in general, yes, there was a seasonal related use question, but not uh, not specific to um, to that type of vehicle or or other device that may be used. And it would be correct to say that the survey itself made no attempt to measure that. Go ahead. Through the chair. Yes, that, that's correct. That was not uh, part of the, um, the review that was undertaken. Uh, thank you. I have Councillor Cuddy before we look for a motion to open the PPM. Thank you. And through you, Chair. Um, I have a couple of technical questions. Uh, number one, and this through the staff. Um, has you, did your study explore whether or not there would be any more than 140 bikes, uh, cyclists across the, the bridge daily if the traffic were eliminated? Mr. Tails? Through the chair. Um, we, we have um, information uh, during COVID uh, related to um, increased use of, of active transportation, but no, not, not directly as part of the, uh, the survey or the traffic work that was done. Follow-up, Councillor? Yes, thank you. I do have a follow-up. Um, thank you. Uh, the other question I have on a technical nature is um, the bridge, you know, is 100, well, it was built in the 1780s, you mentioned, but ostensibly it's at, at a cost of eight million dollars, it's it's a rebuilt bridge, right? It's a new bridge. Yeah, so it is a new bridge. So there's no danger of of the the traffic that we have on now, a thousand cars a day, doing any any damage to the bridge. No, I didn't think so. And thank you, Chair. And I just have one question about uh, to to my colleagues' question about collisions on the bridge. Um, the, the speed limit is 20 miles an hour. I, I can actually run faster than most cars that travel on that bridge. In fact, I probably do. So I don't think there's a lot of collisions on that bridge. Thank you. 
Thank you, and Councillor, just a reminder to keep the comments through the chair, please, and not direct it to other councillors. Thank you. Okay, so what we'll do now is I look, oh, sorry, Councillor Van Meergen, go, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I just wanted to confirm, it was touched on uh, just previously, about the cost of this rehabilitate, rehabilitated bridge. Um, so it's in the neighborhood of eight million. Is there something more specific? Is it more than eight million, a little bit less? We just get confirmation of the cost. Mr. Dales? Yes, through the chair. So the, the um, rehabilitation contract was in the range of, of $8 million. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, committee members, I'll be looking for a motion to open the PPM. I'll need a mover and a seconder. Councillor McAllister and Councillor Cuddy, thank you. And we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to one. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that, uh, we'll look for speakers for the PPM. Um, we do have some folks online as well as people here in the gallery. And thank you to all of those that are attending and participating today. Um, what I'll do is I'll start with someone uh, in the gallery first. What I'll ask is that you state your name. Um, you'll have five minutes, and again, thank you for being here, and then I'll move to someone online and back and forth until we've completed uh, the list of speakers. Uh, please go ahead. And oh, I will be timing as well. Thank you. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Lawrence Durham. Uh, I frequently use the Blackfriars Bridge by bicycle, including in the wintertime, just so you know. <laughs> uh, I feel that Blackfriars Bridge is a treasure we just don't want to lose. Um, I'd like to propose that Council choose option three and ban all cars on the bridge. And that may seem extreme, but there's scientific reasoning to support this, and I'll explain that in a minute. We all know the bridge is very special. And any other, if any other bridge in all of London currently carrying car traffic needed replacement, no one would mind if that bridge, bridge was replaced with a newer, more modern one, especially if it was bigger and wider. But we know with the Blackfriars Bridge, that's not the case. When they restored it in 2018, it was built, rebuilt, and it looks exactly the same as it did the first time. And that's because everybody wants it that way. Um, the bridge has been photographed endlessly and it's come to represent London, and apparently the province agrees too, because they've designated, designated the bridge as an historic structure as part of the Ontario Heritage Act. So when the bridge was built in 1875, it was designed to carry horses, buggies, and people, not cars. Motor vehicle traffic came later, and that's what caused so much damage, and that's why we needed to repair it in 2018. So why would we even think of letting bridge-destroying motor vehicle traffic back on the bridge when we know that it was the main cause of its more rapid deterioration the first time around? Now, I'm just going to talk a little, about, a little bit about the science behind road surface destruction. I'm going to give you some numbers. Um, since the average car weighs about 4,000 pounds, and the average cyclist weighs about 200 pounds, we know that the car is about 20 times heavier than the bicycle. The question is, does that mean that the car causes 20 times more damage to the road than the bicycle? And the answer is no, it's way worse than that. According to scientists who study this sort of thing, it would take 160,000 bicycle trips to cause as much damage to the road surface as a single car driving down the same road just once. Why is that? It's because the load on the road from a bicycle is way less than the axle weight of the car. And there's something called the fourth power law, and it says that the stress to the road is 20 times, but to the power of four, which means 20 times 20 times 20 times 20, is 160,000 times more damage of a car versus a bike. <laughs> and this is kind of crazy. So uh, we know that from the Dillon Report, that um, eastbound traffic is about 1,000 cars per day. That causes a lot of damage, of course, to the bridge. Bicycles, 
not so much, or people, even less. <laughs> Uh, these numbers are astounding, so we can see that with no cars on the bridge, the bridge will last much, much longer. If we want to save the bridge, we can't afford to have bridge-destroying cars anywhere near this structure. And if EV, electric vehicles, they weigh even more than the current cars. So unless we want to go through the same thing we did in 2018, I think we should keep the cars off the bridge. According to the Dillon Report, uh, we've, the car traffic has increased 65% since 2013, Obviously, vehicles have found a way to get around the bridge for seven years, and they can continue to do that. We know it's a little bit inconvenient, but hey, we're saving the bridge. It's worth it. So now's our chance to reduce car traffic to zero, save the bridge. We've seen the math. Um, we know what'll happen to the bridge if we leave cars on for continually, it'll destroy it. Um, is driver convenience really worth destroying the bridge we all love? Cars don't belong on the bridge. It was never designed for them. Uh, it's delicate. And the Wikipedia says about this particular bridge, Bowstring bridges are one of the rarest types of truss bridges, which your staff member mentioned, and it's the most, most of them date to the 1870s. They fell out of favor due to their limited weight they could support, which is my point. <laughs> Any bowstring truss bridge that survives today is a miracle. This is how they describe it. Truss bridges are always delicate structures, but bowstring trusses are even more so. So option three is the best option to save the bridge. It is also aligned with the city's official plan, which says in direction number eight of the London plan, make wise planning decisions. So we urge, you, we urge you to do just that. Vote for option three, make a wise planning decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Durham. Uh, we'll go to a speaker online uh, next. Uh, I'll go to Dorothea Gucciardi, Gucciardo, sorry. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm traveling at the moment. I appreciate um, the opportunity to be able to come in digitally, um, since I, especially since I wasn't able to be in the city for the meeting. Um, thank you to um, the councillors and thank you to the councillor who gave the presentation on the history of the bridge. It was uh, really useful and I think impactful, especially noting the historical significance of this bridge, as the previous uh, commentator also mentioned. You know, in a time of climate emergency, it seems frankly outrageous to me that we're even considering keeping the bridge open to vehicles. Uh, so I'd like to show my support for council choosing option three to close the, the bridge to vehicles year, year round. Um, as it's been noted, it's a historically significant structure, one that was designed and built for modes of transport that did not include cars. Um, and so keeping it closed to vehicles allows for more and safer uh, active transport options along the TVP, which is also one of the gems of London, Ontario. Um, and so Council, I think, should be supporting means for Londoners to choose methods of transport that don't involve using the automobile and closing the Blackfriars Bridge to vehicles um, will enable that option. Uh, further, in terms of uh, transport in the wintertime, I do cycle in the winter as well. Um, yeah, I would cycle a lot more if there were safer options to do so. And closing the Blackfriars Bridge is, is definitely one of those options. Thank you so much for giving me the time to speak today. Uh, thank you very much, much Ms. Gucciardo. Uh, now we'll go back to the gallery. Um, please uh, state your name and you have five minutes and thanks for being here. My name is Kevin Bice. I'm a cyclist, a pedestrian and a car owner. Uh, I'm an artist, which is valid because I've painted and drawn the bridge many, many times. Uh, more importantly, I'm a Blackfriars resident. And uh, for that reason, and for all the above reasons, I support option one, which is keeping the bridge the way it is. Uh, first of all, we need the bridge. Those of us who live in Blackfriars have a limited number of ways of getting out of, the, out of our neighborhood. And in traffic, heavy traffic times at rush hour in the morning, uh, using Oxford Street, or using Riverside Drive is very difficult. Uh, being able to cross Blackfriars Bridge is extremely convenient, um, and, and that, for that reason, I support that. Uh, Dylan also noticed, noted that the bridge <coughs> was needed uh, as what they called a redundancy it, when work is being done on other ways across the river. Secondly, <coughs> closing the bridge to cars means that the bridge is less traveled, which some might argue is a good thing. The problem that arises, however, is that with less traffic, the route feels less safe, especially for young women. I noticed that Dylan's report only looked at traffic crossing the bridge until 6 p.m. 
I have a granddaughter who's living with who else goes to university, and she will not cross the bridge and walk the other side of the river uh, after dark because she feels unsafe. Uh, limiting the number of traffic uh, uh, passages across the bridge by any means uh, will decrease the number of people who have eyes out, particularly late at night. And I think cars are probably the most uh, frequent users after dark. <coughs> uh, third, the current proposal suggests that the bridge be closed in the summer, uh, but summertime is the, driver when, uh, is the time when drivers make most use of the bridge, particularly with business in the area. I was told by Betty Hayden, the former owner of Blackfriars Bistro, that when the bridge closed, their business dropped overnight by 30%. Uh, in a time when we're trying to bring people back into downtown, to close an access to downtown and to limit uh, access to, down to businesses around downtown seems foolish. <coughs> Fourth, the bridge is a defining part of the identity of this city. If it's preserved simply for foot traffic, it becomes less useful. And less useful things, according to what we've seen in London, uh, tend to go to the bottom of the budget pile when it comes to budget crunch time. Look at the former art gallery and library on Queen's Ave, which has been sitting empty for many years. Outside it looks fine, inside it's falling apart. Uh, things that like Eldon House, which are used frequently for a lot of things, uh, get um, uh, are, are much more likelihood of staying there for a long period of time. Uh, Fourth, the current division of space allotted on the bridge for pedestrians, car, and bicycles is good. And to my knowledge, and it was supported by Dylan's report, no accidents have occurred since it was reopened. Uh, uh, Councillor Trasso speculated about what might happen if there were accidents, but the, the result, of course, is there has not been any recorded. So speculating about accidents or near accidents seems foolish to me. Uh, one of the things that I noticed was that in the report, uh, the... Uh, number of transgressions of the speed limit, for example, by cars was one. The number of transgressions by pedestrians and bike users was many more, riding the wrong direction, riding in the wrong lane, etc. I've been given the finger for traveling across the bridge in my car in the designated lane by a pedestrian who was walking in the bike lane. Fifth, or sixth, those who consider that cars are dangerous to pedestrians and bicycles on the bridge ignore the new threat from battery-powered scooters, uh, bicycles, and other non-car travel options. I live right along the river, along the bike path, and the speed at which uh, so-called cycles pa go down there is extremely dangerous uh, to, uh, to a lot of us, and I've nearly been hit a number of times. I noticed in Dylan's report that uh, if the bridge was converted to solely pedestrian and, and, and bicycle use, that the actual weight ratio of using the bridge would have to be increased because uh, pedestrians, a pedestrian load limit is higher than it when cars are, it's mixed use. That would involve more uh, budget items, uh, would involve closing the street permanently and uh, making other alterations to the bridge. Finally, the question that's being asked uh, has been put to Londoners at least twice before, and those of us seconds. in Blackfriars who are most immediately affected by uh, this proposal or these proposals um, are getting a little tired of coming to meetings and uh, listening to yet another question being asked uh, the same way. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bice. We will go to um, Ramsey Andrew in uh, who's online and then we'll go to the gentleman at the top microphone and then to Mr. Wallace and then back online. Uh, so I will go to uh, Ramsey, thank you. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us online today, and you have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the time today, and um, I really appreciate all the comments that were made today. Um, I think either decision by council members today um, is, is a hard one. Um, all options sound very great. Um, I'm here to just provide some comments from, from my perspective here. Um, so I'm, I'm a recent graduate from the IBMBA school here at uh, Western University, uh, and over the past year, I've had the chance to experience the, the bridge both as a local resident and pedestrian, as well as a motorist who's who's used the bridge quite often um, as as a mode um, for for getting back home with my car. Um, so I have a few comments just to kind of add to the conversation, um, and just, you know some some questions for for council members and um, people to think about. Um, I guess the first is is a bit of a side question, and hopefully maybe a council member later on could could mention uh, can answer this. So oh, part of the data that was gathered was around the survey disseminated to locals, um, and it had some pretty pretty striking results to, to speak. 
Um, and the question around that is how was that survey disseminated? Um, because as someone who lives in, in the neighborhood, I, you know, I just as a, a bit of an anecdote, I, I did not receive it, um, nor or I didn't know how how to access that survey over the past year. Um, that being said, um, there's here are some of the comments, and um, I'd like to sort of bring up here. I know traffic was is something that's uh, that was observed, and there's a lot of data as part of Dylan's report um, in terms of making this decision. Um, and I think there's something to be considered here, especially. And uh, I know there's a lot of it's it's not easy to get data on the what ifs, but um, to provide this from my experience here, the traffic on Oxford and Warncliffe is is pretty brutal at times. Um, you know, some many years ago, uh, city planners in London decided that having a train go through the middle of the city was a great idea. And I know that's a bit of a running joke within the city. Um, but for anyone who's driven home um, during rush hour traffic. In that intersection knows how bad the traffic can back up from downtown to war all the way to Warncliffe. Um, something that should take a less than 10 minute drive becomes 20 to 30 to 40 minutes at times. What this bridge does is it provides, you know, very, very needed re traffic relief in that uh, for the people who are trying to get back to the downtown core um, who live there, right? Um, there's, there aren't many options to, to get back home by, by vehicle. And I, I appreciate the comment by um, someone made earlier that, you know, we should be, uh, especially during thinking of climate change, should be getting uh, more cars off the road. And I, I, I totally understand and appreciate it. But for those who don't have that option currently, um, you know, there aren't very many ways to get back to downtown core, um, aside from taking the tunnel <laughs> under the Talbot uh, Bridge there, where it's a one, -way, one lane road, um, or going through Richmond. And then finally, there's this Blackfriars Bridge option, which is a one way one-way traffic back to the downtown core. Um, so I, I understand that option two, you know, it's, it's about looking at there's a higher expected volume of pedestrians and cyclists um, that that comes up during the summer months, and that's understandable. But from what the data shows, there, are, there doesn't seem to be any more than 10 cyclists for 15 minutes, whereas it's about 50 vehicles per 15, uh, 50 vehicles at a time per 15 minutes during that rush hour period, both in the morning and in the afternoons. Um, and understand that there's limited to no accidents um, on according to the reports. And yes, there may be some that were unreported. I, I can appreciate that. Um, but whereas in big cities, when we think about expanding the, the volume or the capacity uh, for, for a given mode of transportation, whether that's cycling, pedestrians, and so on, um, we think about one way we look at it is volume, right? Is there enough biking volume or pedestrian volume that you know we need to create more capacity? Um, the data doesn't seem to really indicate that, in my opinion. And as someone who really enjoys using as a pedestrian, um, there hasn't been times that, you know, like, especially since there's a separation, there hasn't been times where I, I have felt unsafe because of a vehicle driving through it. And I know that's just an anecdote there. Um, but I think, you know, what might be worth considering, and I don't know if that, that was something I missed in the report, is if bike safety is the primary issue there, and that's kind of what we're looking at in terms of these three options, you know, where safety posts or boulder is considered to be added to separate um, where the paint is uh, for the bike lanes for from the vehicles, because um, that that could be kind of what the, the main primary focus is. So again, many questions to, to, to be considered here, and I'm just throwing a bunch of comments out. But um, I think I, I really urge city council members to consider what's the priority here. Um, is it really to make sure it's as safe as possible for bike uh, bikers, pedestrians, and so on? And if that's a priority. Then sure, make a decision in that favor. Um, but consider the options. Seconds. But consider the options within that uh, to, to create that safety. But if traffic is something that should be considered, um, and I, I urge them to really think about that too. Um, this does provide a really necessary sense of relief for for motorists getting back. Thank home. you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, we will go to uh, our speaker in the gallery at the top microphone. Please state your name and you have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Colbert and I want, I'm in favor of uh, keeping one-way traffic on the bridge. I want to address an issue that no one seems to be aware of and that is what happens on the bridge at night when it's closed to traffic. And um, the answer is there's a lot of gatherings that happen and there's a lot of parties that start happening. So I think people are unaware of this. It didn't appear in the report. When I talk to counselors, they say, thank you, I was unaware of that. And most people making comments of it don't seem to know this is happening. I live right beside the bridge, so I have the ringside seat. So I'm here to say that there are parties that happen. So what do I mean? 
I mean loud music, and I mean um, loud voices. I mean people drinking, climbing up on the bridge, three occasions setting off fireworks. So this is happening on the bridge uh, when it was closed. You open the bridge, all this stops because you have a, th whether there are cars coming or not, it's a through road, this stops dead. Uh, I would also note that when the bridge is closed to tra uh, car traffic for an extended period of time, it was getting worse over time. More gatherings, people are cluing in that this is a place they can come to uh, have a bit of a party. There was one, there was one group, don't interrupt buddy. There was one group that, that started coming once a week uh, and it was getting worse, uh, bridges back open and it, it, it stopped completely. So um, I, I, I just want everybody to be aware of this and I think, you know, you create a dead end and I think everybody knows the extreme example in London is probably Bruffdale. You create, you create a dead end in the wrong part of town, you get trouble, people gather there. And that's what we don't need an unrestricted, unsupervised party zone in Blackfriars neighborhood. That's where it's going. So I say nip it in the bud, don't put this through. And then a few years down the road, council and police and citizens are trying to say, what are we gonna do about this? It does happen, I've seen it happen. And I'm asking you to um, go with option one, keep one way traffic. There's not really a problem as far as I can see. There's no serious problem with things the way they are. There could be a very big problem if, uh, if uh, traffic, if it's cut off for traffic for six months a year. So I say uh, leave it to one-way traffic. I, I should add, I'm a green guy. I'm all for the car, uh, anti-car getting off of car uh, initiatives. But this is a different issue and uh, there's something more serious going on. And I just want everybody to be aware of it and take it into consideration. Thanks. Uh, thank you. And that was Mr. Colbert. Did I say that correctly? Thank you. Um, okay, just a reminder to everyone in the gallery, uh, if you can please uh, refrain from commenting when others are speaking or clapping or cheering, uh, it, it just creates a, a better atmosphere for everyone that feels comfortable to speak. Um, I'm going to go to Mr. Wallace, and then I'm going to go to Dr. Labani online, and then back into the gallery, okay? Mike on here. There we go. go uh, ahead, thank you, Mr. Madam Wallace, Chair. Five minutes. It's uh, Mike Wallace, uh, Executive Director for the London Development Institute. Uh, this morning, I sent everybody an email, and I'm just going to highlight uh, our, our position. I'm here representing uh, many of the members in the LDI. Um, uh, have uh, property downtown, both uh, uh, office space, uh, uh, residential, and. and um, as we heard last night, uh, some parking lots. But the uh, 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 so I'm here representing uh, their position. On uh, we sent them around the report that uh, that was in the agenda, and in my email this morning, there's really um, uh, three points. One, let's let's start from the beginning. We think you should choose option one and not option two, uh, based on the information that's been provided. If you look carefully at the traffic study. There really is not a compelling reason to, to go with option two. It's a choice, but it's not a compelling reason in our view. And if you look at what the Dillon report, and I'm not sure if there's members from Dillon here, uh, consultants should be invited to these meetings, so for technical questions in my view, but um, uh, traffic volumes and the, uh, the vehicles, it was not overwhelming. There's no evidence of collisions. The bridge actually meets the definition of what the of a neighborhood connector street in the London plan. It actually meets the London plan's requirements, and the bridge provides a much needed connectivity to the downtown. All in the Dillon report. That's point number one. Point number two. I'm not going to talk about what it, the importance of the bridge for the uh, for the commerce uh, aspects that it can provide, but your own vision for the city for downtown, for the core, in your strat plan that you just passed, highlights the need for access for events and festivals. You want to grow that. You want to be bigger than what you are now. You want, you want to be, uh, you're envisioning uh, that this will be the cultural and community lifeblood of London. And we agree with what that opportunity is for London. We think option two and option three in particular, but option two also, restricts 
opportunities for Londoners to get downtown to experience that uh, life that you're trying to create in the downtown core at the actual time when those festivals and and uh, events are hoping to be um, uh, viable and increase um, the quality of life here in London. Thirdly, which we heard, the bridge isn't the old bridge. It is a new bridge, uh, an $8 million bridge that all taxpayers paid for. And we think that all taxpayers should have an opportunity to use that bridge that they paid for. You would not be rebuilding a road in downtown and not putting bike lanes on there. You've rebuilt a bridge. Why are you not having vehicles on it? <laughs> so if it's not broken, do not fix it, in our view. On another note, I do appreciate that the City of London has PPMs. This is not, PPMs are a requirement of the Planning Act. This is not a Planning Act uh, event. I appreciate the opportunity as a citizen, as an, or representing an organization, an opportunity to talk uh, 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 to policy issues that are facing the city. Um, uh, that uh, opportunity doesn't happen on all files at the city, but in this one it does, and we do appreciate that. I'm not here too often, I'm mostly at PEC. Uh, the only other point that was made today that I'd like to just follow up on is on the actual survey. Actual survey showed 49%, less than 50, in favor of, uh, I believe, option two. That means that the other half either disagree or have no opinion. 49% of the 1,200 um, uh, surveys is not a significant number. It's a 50-50 call. We're asking you to side on the side of option one to allow all citizens, regardless of their choice of mode of transportation, to use the bridge that they pay for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Uh, I'll go to uh, our next speaker online, Dr. Labani. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Um, uh, before you begin, I just want to remind you that you have five minutes and uh, you can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to highlight a couple of points. I'm here with my hat on as an emergency physician who works uh, with the trauma team in London, Ontario, and also as a bit of a general practitioner, which is uh, a lot of what our work is in the emergency department. Uh, it's pretty clear that when I talk to my colleagues in other trauma conferences, London is behind. We are not at a place where we are protecting non-vehicular users, and we're not in a place where we are actually providing them with the safety and the care that they need. The evidence of this is what we see in these reports, that there are not as many bike users as there usually would be for these kinds of pathways and passages. And so what the report is really reflecting is that people don't feel safe. The question then should be, why don't people feel safe? <clears throat> to the point about summer being safe in London, we consider trauma season to start May 2-4 and end Labor Day. 83%, this is, these are London statistics, 83% of our pedestrian versus car uh, accidents happen between those dates. And so it is clear that people are driving faster, paying less attention, often uh, alcohol or substances are involved. And this is when pedestrians are dying in London. This is when pedestrians are being harmed in London. As you probably realize, vehicles have gotten bigger, faster, and people have become more distracted on the roads. And so there is more damage. For people to be able to actually use bike paths and bike uh, places they have to feel safe. And this is the only collision point between Wellington and basically uh, Masonville. It's the only place where vehicles and pedestrians have to cross, uh, sorry, like uh, non-motorized vehicles and pedestrians have to cross cars, trucks and other vehicles. So when we're talking about uh, making people feel safe, this has to be one of the major and main considerations. For me, really, I care about this from two perspectives. I've put together too many people, talked to too many families, pronounced too many deaths for me to sit here and not say something about how we should enhance this transport network. 
even if it is true that there are no collisions on this bridge, that takes away the point that having vehicles on this bridge creates collisions elsewhere because people are not able to use this pathway properly because people do not feel safe in this pathway. Um, in terms of the, the speeds, yes, of course, uh, I really very much support lower speed limits and I'm happy for them. However, the counselor who mentioned that he can run faster than a car uh, very likely does not weigh as much as a car, despite how much brass he might be carrying. So it is simply um, not true to compare the two, a person running and a vehicle of any kind, which, which are weighing more and more, especially as we get into electric vehicles. As for the other hat that I wear, a public health hat, I tell my patients to try to get outside, to walk, to do things. And very often they say to me, but how, but where? Social interactions, which have been one of the biggest victims of the last few years, have, have been something that have been moving outside and people are trying to find safe places to go outside. And the gentleman uh, who spoke, uh, I think two people before me observed that there are more social interactions right now, that more people are using outdoor public spaces to do outdoor public things. And so, um, in terms of, uh, of that, that seems to me to be a victory, an exact uh, confirmation of the fact that when you create spaces that are safe for people, people will use them, including for social activity. Downtown is in trouble, not because it has too much pedestrianization, not because it has too much active transport, but because these things have been neglected. Maybe it's time for the business interests in the community to look at things that have worked in other communities and other cities. 30 seconds. I mentioned, that, seconds. I mentioned what I'm in other, uh, in other conferences that people mentioned their cities have it much better. The people from Europe just laugh at us. They seem to have figured this out and we should look to their example. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will move back to our speakers in the gallery and I'll go to the gentleman at the lower mic first and then I'll go to Ms. Lowen Nair at the top mic. Yeah, my name is uh, Jamie Harris. Um, I'm a car driver and a pedestrian. Um, I'm not a walk. I'm not a bicyclist. Uh, one thing I would like to mention off the top is the fact that the uh, exit from the bridge uh, directly crosses the the um, Thames Valley uh, Parkway, and uh, I have witnessed and I have experienced numerous occasions that despite the uh, lights being on, I have seen people almost hit. I have been almost hit going across there. Um, that type of uh, activity, I think, needs to be recognized as a, a product of car use. Um, but my main concern is the fact that I grew up underneath this bridge as much as I ever grew up. And um, uh, so I'm deeply attached to it, and I'm, I'm whether it's been uh, uh, reconditioned and, and so on, it's still the same old bridge as far as I'm concerned. And I think it's a heritage piece that needs to be preserved. And I think all the options, with the exception of option three, uh, do not lend themselves to the preservation of this uh, structure. Um, it's fine to say that we have speed limits on this bridge, uh, possibly there are even weight limits, but um, from my personal, and this is anecdotal, I don't sit there with a, on a chair measuring with a radar gun, but I know the majority of cars that go across that bridge are going more than 20 clicks. And um, um, it, it troubles me every time I see it, and uh, I make my feelings known from time to time uh, to the drivers. Beyond that, I see vehicles uh, other than cars using this bridge. I've seen perlator uh, trucks go across that bridge. I've seen CAA tow trucks go across that bridge, um, et cetera. Uh, these are and huge monster uh, pickup trucks uh, that, as far as I'm concerned, should not even be allowed in the city uh, go across that bridge. And they are, they are, they are archetyp archetypical 
destructors of this bridge. As far as option two is concerned, uh, I think it's a, it's a bit of a, uh, um, um, a red herring. I, I think that cars going across the bridge in the winter time will do more damage than the cars going across the bridge in the summertime. The bridge structure is more brittle in the winter and cars are carrying salt. And salt is the worst uh, offender as far as infrastructure is concerned, aside from compression and so on and so forth. And if you want to have this bridge rot away, uh, just have salt dripping vehicles go across it in the winter and it will rot away once again. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to Ms. Lowen Nair at the back mic. And then if anyone else is looking to spe speak, please make your way to the microphones. You can use uh, any of the mics that are available. Uh, please go ahead. You have five minutes. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Andrea Lowen Nair. And um, for those of you who don't know much about me, uh, we own two businesses, one in Old North and one in Old South. And we have made the family decision to reduce our carbon emissions as much as possible. So we've actually gone down to one vehicle for all four of us, two teenagers, my husband and I, and we're trying to make that work. <laughs> so uh, because my one business is in Old South, I'm on the TVP six to 12 times per day. And um, half of those times, I have a child, a teenager behind me because I have a cargo bike. So I'm taking somebody, there are two of us on one bike. And we had the fun that my youngest son is a performer. He was in Elf at the Grand Theater. And so I was taking him to the Grand Theater four times per day <laughs> uh, all through that run. That was November and December on the bike. So we, that was the, in the months that you're considering closing it. So having read the study and also the community, um, sorry, the Climate Environment Action Plan, um, and I know that the goals are not being reached for the CEAP, and uh, I know that that's probably very discouraging to you. Um, in deciding what to do with the bridge, it's not just looking at the survey and, and thinking about the word compelling, which has been used a few times. It's understanding for the next 20 to 40 years, decisions that you make now, how it will impact the flow of people in your city. So are you wanting to move towards reducing the carbon emissions in London? and the greenhouse gases then make decisions accordingly. So the, um, when I go up and down uh, the TVP, there's actually another consideration that's not in the report and it's the hill coming out of the bridge. So have any of you biked up the hill going to the bridge and then turned left and gone up the hill um, right out? Yes, that's right out where you can access, you know, that's how we access everything. We don't go down Richmond Street because unfortunately it's just not safe enough on a bike yet. Um, let's get there too. <laughs> that's another meeting. But anyway, so we get to Richmond and my son gets to Central by using the TVP turning left and going up right out at the bridge. Often it's dangerous because there are uh, distracted drivers and we can't, you know, that's not in the survey. But the hill does not have enough room on it coming down um, the bike lane is probably standard bike lane width, but the, the vegetation has grown, and so you can't actually go in the bike lane. You have to go beside it. And the majority of the time, there are people walking in that bike lane coming off of Blackfriars Bridge. So if there are vehicles coming, there are actually no rooms for bike. There are often no room for bikes because you have to go around all the plants. Um, and when you're coming up, there isn't enough room because the vehicles, when they're passing you, um, generally don't give you enough space. And when I have a child on, on the back of my bike, that's very, um, very unnerving. <laughs> um, the other consideration is that it's often icy. And so when you're going up an icy road with a child or by myself, you do need to give yourself more room. You can't bike in exactly a straight line or in the bike lane when there's ice and you're going up and down that hill. So don't just think about the bridge. Think about how we're getting in and out off of the bridge. Um, you're going to hear a lot of people want things to stay the same and want to stay in car-centric mode, but we really do need to think forward of how you're going to improve greenhouse gases in London, how you're going to get more people on their bikes, and they would do that because we have research that shows the more infrastructure there is, more people get on bikes. So hopefully you'll make a decision in that direction. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
uh, additional speakers. Uh, I'll go to the lower mic first and then to the top mic. Please state your name and you have five minutes. My name is Molly Mixa. I'm the executive director of London CycleLink. I am here to ask the committee to support option three of the staff report to permanently close Blackfriars Bridge to cars. Um, I'll start with my personal connection to the bridge and then get a little bit more academic. Um, and noting the important uh, two infrastructure elements, both the bridge and the TVP where it crosses uh, at the bridge. Um, my use of the bridge itself has been mainly for recreation and leisure, mostly as a cyclist. Um, when London Cycle Link is planning routes for group rides, such as the Forest City Slow Roll uh, that we just had on, on June 3rd, where we saw about 300 people riding their bikes in celebration, um, when we plan these routes, we almost always include Blackfriars Bridge in our route. And that part of the ride, uh, often traveling north on the west side of the river, crossing the bridge going east, um, is my favorite part of every ride. The view of the river, the trees, the historic bridge, and the cyclists moving from the multi-use path onto the bridge, this is a beautiful and cherished sight. Actually, it is probably my favorite spot to ride anywhere in London. Uh, this is a rare moment when the forest city feels like it might be an apt name. This is a treasure. I don't feel this way when I'm driving across the bridge in a car. The other infrastructure to note, as I said, is the TVP as it crosses the bridge to the east. Uh, when I was at Western a few years ago, I commuted by bike multiple times a week and crossed the TVP at Blackfriars on, on my route. Um, I was lucky to have such a lovely commute and it was great to have the bridge closed to car traffic at this time. The TVP at Blackfriars was one of the first places my kids went on their bikes when they learned to ride. It was the first place my younger son took a tumble on his bike. And there were no cars at this time in that place, and he was fine. I would ask that we have a place of beauty in London for enjoyment, for traveling in ways that allow us to connect to nature, ourselves, and each other. Um, so I've read the various reports. Uh, data from the Dillon report shows that car traffic is more or less on par with active transportation traffic, so people on foot, bike, scooter, etc., on weekdays, and that on weekends, active travel tops car travel. This is not a necessary thoroughfare for cars. The report measured car traffic at about two vehicles per minute, translating to 100, 120 cars per hour. By contrast, um, I was about a week ago, uh, exactly a week ago, at Wortley Road in Askin, counting cars for pedal pole, the national bike count. There were over a thousand cars between 2 and 4 p.m. going through that intersection. Wortley is not a major route. Um, the Dillon report notes that the relatively low volume of cars currently using the bridge can be reassigned to the surrounding network with minimal impacts. Notes that the city's transportation demand model does not show an increase in traffic demands across the Thames River screen line in the future and therefore additional capacity is not required between Oxford and Riverside. Notes that traffic volumes in 2022 continue to be significantly lower than 2017 traffic volumes. The report notes the use of bridge by joggers, pedestrians, people on scooters, and people doing photo shoots. It notes joggers using the vehicle lane to avoid people on the bridge, suggesting that joggers desire more space than they are provided and it extrapolates this to likely include dog walkers and people using mobility devices. It notes vehicles speeding on Blackfriars Street and some visibility concerns for the TVP crossing as factors that may affect the experience for pedestrians and cyclists using the bridge. The city staff report says that of the options, all options are feasible. The Heal Lab report uh, notes that most pedestrians feel unsafe during at least some of their bridge crossings. It also notes that Blackfriars Bridge is an important historical monument to London residents. In terms of the seasonality, the Heal Lab report shows that active transportation users, um, of them, 51% use the bridge the same in the winter as in the summer. 44% use it less in the winter, but continue to use it in the winter. Only 5% 
don't use the bridge in the winter for active transit of the ones that use it in the summer. 15 seconds. Um, also, drivers are, are, are frustrated with the constant rerouting and construction. Um, so uh, I would ask that uh, we don't reroute people twice a year. Um, rates of cycling are increasing. Climate change means the number of warm days are increasing. Climate emergency Thank means you. we need fewer cars. <laughs> And our mental health asks us for a place to relax and enjoy our city. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the speaker at the back microphone, please. Hi. If you could state your name and yep. then you have five minutes. My name is Jennifer Nechtel, and I'm just speaking for myself and my partner, Andy Scheibner. Um, Andy owns a place. Sorry, can you just uh, start again and just uh, move the microphone down? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Can everybody hear me now? <laughs> um, we have an interest uh, in Black Fires. Uh, I lived there for... Could you just... Sure. Sorry, we're just having a little bit of difficulty. I think they just raised the volume. If you could just say your name again and then restart. Thank you. Sure. Jennifer Nechtel. Okay. So I lived in Black Fires area. Um, and I'm also speaking on behalf of Andy Scheibner. He owns a house on Black Fires, just a few cottage houses up from the bridge. Um, a lot of people may or may not know this, but uh, Blackfriars area is a heritage area. It's called Petersville now. Um, the Blackfriars Bridge is also a heritage bridge. I know it's been replaced in 2018, but people know it as a heritage site because they come from everywhere to see it, take pictures. Um, the road and the bridge were made for horse and buggy. It's a very, very narrow road. If you've lived on that road, then you understand how narrow it is. Um, traffic is is a lot. A few cars on that street is a lot. Um, they don't abide by the speed limit. The joke was that we would sit there at night and watch to see how fast cars would actually go. Uh, the city eventually put in um, signs to let us know how fast cars were actually going, so our guesses were pretty good. Um, a lot of cars would go over 100 kilometers an hour down that street. Can you imagine having children living on that street and your house being that close to the road and people barreling down. And it was not just a few occasions, it was a lot of occasions. Um, a lot of those houses, cottage houses, have rooms, bedrooms that are built in the front. So if a car were to skip the um, any part of the edge of the road, they'd be into a bedroom. And in fact, that did happen when a car went through a house on Blackfire Street. Um, there's been many, many incidences, maybe not reported, but very many incidences with cars um, and incidences on that street. I, I know this because I've lived there and I've witnessed it. Um, when you have heritage, uh, heritage areas and heritage sites, um, you need to uh, mitigate risk. Um, that's just part of having a heritage site. So taking away cars would be an advantageous thing. Um, there's other routes to use. There's Oxford Street, there's Riverside Drive, there's other places to use. I know it's, it gets congested down there, but it also gets congested when you live there um, and you have to watch people barrel down a very, very small road again and a small bridge uh, was made for horse and buggy. People do want to get out there now and get exercise. It's really good for people's mental health and well-being, as the doctor said and many of the people here in the gallery have already said. Um, we need a safe place to do that um, and to shut down the bridge for um, traffic by car would be a great start. I have actually seen the batter buses for um, Budweiser Gardens go over that bridge. Even though we've told them, no, no, they still go over. So all the people that are using that bridge, if you let a vehicle over, they think it's everybody and that's just a green light for everybody to go over. Um, I'm just here to ask that it be considered that the money that they're going to put towards the bridge, they can put a modest towards the upkeep for pedestrian and for bikes and for scooters and for people to get over and enjoy it. Um, but the extra money be put towards a bigger crisis in the city, which is homelessness. Homelessness and um, people that are seniors that don't have enough to be able to sustain basic necessities those people should be getting uh, the money uh, right now. They need the attention. We need to do a better job in the city with regards to that I'm a healthcare worker. And I can tell you that um, I definitely agree with the doctor that spoke and I definitely agree with um, 
trying to look at the way that we spend money in the city and how the future will be. And I think that we definitely need to consider more options to help people get the basic necessities of life. And if it means having cars get another way to work, um, maybe encourage people to do ride share, encourage people to bike and walk, then maybe we, shutting the bridge down is a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll go to the speaker at the lower microphone. Please state your name and you have five minutes. Quinn Fleming. I'm just going to speak in point form because this entire thing has been pretty uh, disappointing and frustrating. Uh, I thought we had to come prepared with uh, scientifically backed arguments, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, so in terms of safety and statistics, because I'm trained in math as well, in terms of reporting data, I got assaulted walking out of my apartment, right? There's a meth dealer in my apartment that I got assaulted from and they're like community coming in and about. Like I didn't report that. I had to come here, right? So I've been hit multiple times by cars crossing Blackfire Bridge as a pedestrian. I don't call the cops because you just, we've given up on the cops, right? So for the city, the staff member to say that they don't consider that in reporting is statistical negligence and that's just disappointing. So we need active transportation in the city. Um, we need individuals that can't afford cars to get around the city. Um, people that can't afford cars, because when you say we need everybody to enjoy the city, that means it needs to be safe for pedestrians. People that can't afford cars, like youth and kids, that need to get around and have independence in the city for a better quality of life. Um, the environmental in impact, right? I was six years old when we talked about the merits of recycling, and now I'm going to repeat three times. The country is on fire. The country is on fire. The country is literally on fire, and we're talking about favoring cars, right? Like, I was six years old, and it seems like the adults still don't get it, so that's cool. Um, community connectivity, right? The Thames Valley Parkway is our pride and joy, and we shouldn't be running cars through it. Not only should we be closing down this section, we also need to be closing down the section through Richmond, right, where the entire pathway is caused to a complete close because we have to yield to the cars, right? No way, we're dumb, right? And so, like, it's really disappointing to see, like, uh, comments from councillors, like Councillor Cuddy, like, the degradation of bridges rely on weight. The degradation of infrastructure relies on weight. Like that's such, how can you say a comment when that's such like, uh, you can YouTube that and learn about how bridges degrade, right? Cars degrade bridges faster than humans. That's math and like, uh, yeah. So like uh, the fact that you get a vote and I don't is weird. Um, and also like, I can run faster than you. I'd, I'd kind of doubt you can run 20 kilometers an hour, please right? But keep, neither of us run a thousand kilometers an hour. Excuse me, please keep your comments to the actual issue that we have at hand right now, which is the Blackfriars Bridge. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah, the issue um, that we have in a sense, in terms of this issue that's um, highlighted is our lack of leadership in seeing forward into the area, right? Into the future. The country's on fire. We shouldn't be prioritizing one person that literally says they want to skip rush hour to skip Oxford and Richmond, right? I skip rush hour because it's a bike, because I realize it's reliable, it's always 15 minutes, and that's how I can skip rush hour. We shouldn't be having an entire bridge so that guy can skip his rush hour thing. And we shouldn't be having an entire bridge so a local neighbor can skip a five minute walk and take a car to a local business instead. Walk to the local business, right? If you actually sold your car and didn't pay that insurance, you could spend more money on local businesses. These are just the fundamental basic economics that Europeans have figured out. But for some reason, we're just culturally inept. And like, again, our country's on fire and like the adults haven't changed their tone. That's it, goodbye. Thank you. Um, looking for any additional speakers. Uh, thank you. I have Mr. Brown. Go ahead uh, at the back mic. Just give us a moment to, to get that mic working. I feel like I'm at a Leafs game with all the boards up here. Sean, just, must, be, just Sean must be happy. Just one moment, Mr. <laughs> Brown. Your mic isn't on yet. Hold on. OK. Do you want to give it a test? And please state your name, and then you have five no, minutes. Oh, yeah, we are. Good. I, I have one uh, technical question before I add my comments here. Not one point have we talked about the cost difference between leaving the bridge open for vehicular, vehicular traffic versus closing it to vehicular traffic. I mean, we're not closing the bridge, let's understand. We're closing it to a single mode of transportation. All the other modes will be okay. But 
there has to be a difference in cost between driving cars over the bridge and bicycles. There's a difference in cost to everything else. And what is this cost difference over the life cycle of the bridge? Because taxpayers are going to have to pay that. And having this discussion without knowing that data is very irresponsible because that's ultimately you're the ones who control the purse, right? Anyhow, my comments as to the issue itself. Uh, I'll concede what my friend Jeff has to say. Jeff's a very hardcore environmentalist, and I can guarantee I've knocked on every door in Blackfriars more than anybody in this room. And we talked about this a few years ago. And if that's the overriding concern, then, you know, I'll concede that. If that's what it is, that's what it is. But you've all signed a climate emergency action plan. And if you are going to vote to allow cars over this bridge, every one of you is going to have to look me in the face and tell me how that is in accordance with your climate emergency action plan. Because you can't talk out both sides of your mouth. It's one or the other. I've seen submissions. I read all the submissions. Somebody sitting here telling me this is good for the environment. If you believe that, I've got a bridge in Brooklyn. You can come see me afterwards. I will sell it to you. Opening a bridge to cars is not good for the environment. I stood here 15 years ago when we were trying to place a moratorium on Tim Hortons. And I had some lawyers standing down there trying to explain to council how a car idling was better for the environment than a car not even on. Very interesting. It seems like we're hearing the same argument again. You know, and one thing we haven't talked about, and I haven't heard it mentioned today, there's a school in this neighborhood. What effect is this going to have on children walking to school or biking to school? Are they going to have to get in a car now as well? Because our, our future is going to be carless, no matter what we decide here. We're just talking a matter of time in this world. All right? And our kids have to walk to school. I live in the core of this city, so I can bike and I can walk if I want. I wouldn't consider driving downtown. That's why I live near downtown. I'm assuming most people probably live in Blackfriars for the same reason. They don't need a shortcut for their car to get downtown. Oh, yeah. They are very happy to walk. They are very happy to cycle. Oh, yeah, yeah, it is their lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. We know that cycling is a core phenomena in every city in the world. Let's do everything we can to support it in our city because up till now, We've been failing to do so. And it's time to make a statement that this matters to us. Anyhow, anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you. Looking to gallery and online to see if there's any additional speakers. Last call for speakers. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll be looking to members of the committee for a motion to close the PPM. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, I uh, didn't see you. Go ahead. Please state your name and uh, you have five minutes. Uh, my name is Amy Lee. I have been um, living near Black Frere Bridge for 17 years and uh, I support the option three uh, because when you work walking, you are very relaxed. It's very easy to be hit by the car uh, when they get into the bridge. I have the experience like that. Mm, and I also, I, uh, that's my opinion. I support the option three, uh, close the bridge and so people can walk in safely. And uh, I always walk to the downtown mm, and uh, that's my opinion. Thanks. Thank you. I'll look again for additional speakers. Okay, seeing no one at the microphones and no one online, I'll look to committee to, for a motion to close the PPM. Councillor Van Muurbergen, seconded by Councillor Trosso. And we'll open that for vote. Closing the vote, the motion is raised five to zero. 
Thank you. Uh, before we begin our discussion, there were a few questions asked by speakers uh, during the, uh, the PPM uh, that I just wanted to um, give staff an opportunity to address. Uh, the first was, how was the survey distributed? And the next one, uh, these were for the questions I had from Mr. Andrew, was, uh, was paint separation between uh, the, the or, or more than paint separation between vehicles and pedestrians considered? Mr. Dales. Thank you, through the chair. Uh, so in terms of the survey, uh, and we, I made the remark uh, that we had a, uh, a very um, robust response of 1,200 residents or, or respondents to that survey. Uh, the survey had been distributed, uh, and this is where we worked with the um, HEAL lab at, the, uh, at Western. Uh, so it had been distributed to resident, local residents, businesses, uh, as well as um, a contact list that was developed through the environmental assessment process that had been completed. Information was also available through the Get Involved site. Uh, and then there was intercept surveys uh, that were completed by the he uh, folks from HEAL. So people uh, at the bridge site that provided um, pamphlets or a brochure related to the survey with a QR code. So a uh, number of means by which we attempted to, uh, to reach out to as many residents as possible regarding the, uh, the survey. Thank you. Uh, the additional question we had about uh, the paint, uh, or more than paint separation, and then there was also a question about was the cost of the difference uh, for deterioration of bridge due to car or vice, bicycle and pedestrian considered, and that was from Mr. Brown. So, um, for the first question related to the, um, the change to the separation. So the, the, um, the cycling lane is currently delineated with a, um, a, with, through pavement markings. Um, that, that's not to say that there aren't other options that would be available in terms of uh, uh, flexible bullards or posts that could be erected on, on the bridge. Um, the, the next question related to the life cycle cost. Um, I, I would note that Within the city, all of our bridges are inspected on a, a regular basis. That is a requirement uh, of the province and um, consistent with, uh, with how we manage our assets. So th those costs uh, would continue to apply regardless of uh, the use of, of the bridge. Uh, that work would have to be completed. Uh, regarding the life, we, we have not completed at this point a detailed life cycle cost analysis on the options. Um, really awaiting um, additional direction in terms of uh, a preferred option. But uh, at, at this point, that work has not been, been undertaken. Thank you. Um, so I'm sure that there are questions from members of council, um, but I'll also uh, want to give councillors an opportunity. You can frame the discussion by putting forward uh, the motion that's, that's in front of you. Do I see hands to do that? Councillor McAllister, go ahead. Um, I would actually like to put forward a, a motion. Okay, thank you. Um, is it uh, separate from the staff motion that, that's provided or the staff recommendation that's provided? Uh, yes, I'd like to put forward an alternative motion. Okay, thank you. Um, I understand that the clerk has the wording for, for your alternative motion. Um, yeah, we have to, she should advise me, so we have to vote on the original first, and then we can entertain uh, an additional motion. Um, so we have the original motion in front of us. Do we have a mover and a seconder to uh, entertain that motion first? And then if we're looking for additional motions, again, that would have to be uh, either, um, that motion would have to be defeated, and then we can, we can look to our alternate motions. Uh, uh, Councillor Rahman, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, Thank you. Sorry, uh, Dr. Angelos. Yep, go ahead. Uh, on a point of order in terms of process, you are at committee. The, the staff recommendation does not have to be put on the floor. Councillors can put forward an alternate uh, motion. It's only at council that the staff recom or the committee Thank recommendation you. has to be defeated. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll just confer again with the clerk and then we'll look to put a motion forward. And I understand that we've received uh, language from Councillor McAllister if he'd like to move that uh, first since he had his hand up first and then we'll go from there.
Okay, so we're just uh, waiting for confirmation just on, on process. Uh, we're looking at um, the fact that the original motion had an A and a B. And uh, if I understand, uh, Councillor McAllister, your motion is to replace part A. So you'd be, would you be looking to add part B back in, which is the long, the recommendation to the Ontario Ministry of Environment and then it also contains the, the speakers for today and the added agenda items. Okay, so we'll just uh, get that loaded into eScribe for uh, for the committee and then also put it on the screen so that others can uh, be able to view it and then we'd be looking for a seconder. And that will help to frame our discussion. Councillor Van Muurbergen. Yeah, thanks Chair. Um, I'm, no, I'm just looking for clarification. I had to uh, step out for a minute. So uh, where are we right now? Thank you. So what we're doing is we had a staff recommendation, but we've been informed that we can just put on uh, the motion that Councillor McAllister is proposing. Um, I can have him speak to it once it's loaded in for you so that you can see, and then we'll be looking for, for if there's a seconder to his motion. So if I could, um, there, were, there were three options. Is this new motion, for example, option one? Thank you. Councillor McAllister, would you like to speak to it? Go ahead. Uh, thank you. And through the chair, um, my motion uh, is to uh, put forward option one. And uh, I, I can speak to it now if uh, the chair will allow. Yeah. Uh, yep, we're just loading it in, so go ahead. Okay, and uh, I, first off, I want to thank everyone for um, the oh, discussion. Actually, just, just to before you speak to it, why don't we um, look for a seconder to see if before we... Okay, Councillor Van Muurbergen has seconded it. Go ahead. Um, first off, I want to thank everyone for sharing their thoughts. Um, I know this is a, an issue um, that people care very deeply about. Um, and in looking at all the options, I, I still believe that option one um, suits the needs of Londoners. Um, you know, as a council, we have to look at um, everyone. Um, as has been mentioned, um, a lot of money went into the rehabilitation of this bridge, and I appreciate that we want to keep it for future generations but it is a key access point for that part of the downtown. And I would like to see um, shared usage for all modes of transit um, into that area. Um, I recognize, you know, everyone has uh, their points of view. Um, we have to weigh the pros and cons of um, difficult decisions like this. And I personally believe that um, this one um, meets the needs of Londoners. And I, I will stand by that decision. I know there's a great deal of uh, concern in terms of the environmental impact. And I do recognize that. But at the same time, I think there are other areas where we can make more of an impact. And I'm not precluding that this issue might come back to us, as has been uh, brought up, that it has come back before. Uh, and maybe in the future, we can revisit it. Um, but in the, in the current climate, I, I think that um, it's warranted to keep it open for, for everyone. And uh, I will leave it there, and I will hopefully um, look to my colleagues to support this, uh, this motion. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And again, I'll just remind people in the gallery that we, we don't clap uh, for, for committee members as well. Um, okay, before we uh, go to additional speakers, we are trying to get the motion up so that everybody and the public can see it. Um, I will check in with the seconder first to see if you'd like to speak to the motion, and then I'll go to members of committee and then members of visiting council. Councillor Van Muurbergen, go ahead. Well, um, we all know that Lon London is a river city, and therefore we are a bridge city. Bridges are integral to the functioning of our city dynamic, our city economy, uh, the very social fabric. And that means we have to be able to transport ourselves in various manners across these precious bridges. Now I recall, um, it was a few councils ago, when this came forward about what to do with the failing um, Blackfriars Bridge and this is the result, 
And we, we owe it to ourselves to keep this open year round to vehicular traffic and not try to use some type of um, wisdom of Solomon where we try to split the baby and, and satisfy both uh, perhaps points of view by going to a half a year, another half a year with vehicles, one with not. Um, it's almost like the routine we do when we change clocks. Uh, it, it, it will become confusing to drivers, especially for the first couple of weeks, three weeks or so after the transition. And I think that brings in its own inherent um, safety problems. But one of the most interesting aspects of this was heard today, but I also received, and I think most of us did, um, correspondence from neighbors in the Blackfriars area about the problem when there is no vehicular traffic, the problem of uh, rowdy behavior, drunkenness, uh, climbing up the bridge itself. That's, that is not a function of a healthy neighborhood and certainly does not add to it. Uh, so I wholeheartedly support option one. I thank staff for the report. I thank staff for bringing the option one as a, a alternative. And I think it makes um, clear sense, very logical, and I hope we all support it. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have Councillor Trossa. We're still just sorting out some of the wording on, on the motion, but um, again, we're talking about option one, which is all modes of traffic access, and we're just uh, looking to add the additional language in terms of what has to go uh, to the ministry and um, what took place in the PPM. So I'll go to Councillor Trosso next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you to everyone in, in the audience. And through the chair, um, I'm going to be voting no on this, on this amendment. In fact, um, I think uh, my colleague, Councillor Vandenbergen, made a good point, and that is splitting the difference is going to create a lot of problems, which is exact. Oh, am I too far? Which is exactly why I was going to move a motion for uh, option three, which, uh, which I will do if this motion is defeated. So I want to get next in line for the amendments if this is defeated. I think it's irresponsible. And I don't say this lightly. I think it's irresponsible to open the bridge right now, given a couple of considerations. Number one, our stated climate emergency. Yes, there are bigger things we can do, but every little thing, every little thing counts. We, all, we have a staff report that says there, there's no serious effect on traffic to make to, 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 shut, to shut this down. And I think we'd be having a much more difficult discussion weighing different difficult uh, options if, if that weren't the case. But in addition to the environmental degradation that will continue with this vehicular traffic and the threat to public safety that will continue with this vehicular traffic, I think that those that want to keep the bridge open all of the time have a responsibility to come forward or at least ask for some cost data to come forward or at least ask for some stress data. This is going to have costs. This is not going to be free. This is not, oh, well, this is nice because now people in, 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 on the west side can just come downtown with having to use, without having to use Oxford or Riverside. So I, I hope, I hope that, the, that the proponents of this motion, uh, in, in, including the seconder and, uh, and the proponent, would withdraw this and uh, refer it to get more information. If this is really what you want to do, uh, and I'm speaking through the chair, of, 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 of course, but I think, I think this is not, not, good, not good policy. And it's certainly not in keeping with our declared climate emergency. It's certainly not in keeping with the plans that we've done. It's not in keeping with the strategic plan. Um, so I think there are many reasons to, um, to, to oppose this. One of the things that the, um, that has to be looked at, I think first and foremost, is the safety of people using the bridge. And I think right now that is being challenged. And I, I don't want to debate the merits of option three because that's not on the floor 
right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little constrained in terms of what I can say. I'll come back, I'll come back to this argument if, if the motion doesn't pass. But I think it's really important to acknowledge that th there's, there, there's good reason why the staff report did not, did not choose option one. Although, in fairness, the staff report said all three options are viable and we could go either way. But through the chair to staff, are there going to be additional costs if we, if we allow um, traffic all year round? Thank you. Um, so I have a number of visiting counselors on the list. I will go. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Dales. Uh, Madam Chair, could we seek some clarification? Are there additional costs to modify the bridge to allow traffic year round or additional long term maintenance and operational costs? In the long term, will allowing all year vehicular traffic on the bridge entail additional um, costs? Those costs are. I'm using the term costs very broadly, uh, wear and tear on the bridge, but also maintenance costs and also costs of uh, tending to uh, issues that occur on the bridge. Will there be costs? Madam Chair, I Thank think it would be, diff be difficult to speculate on exactly what the costs could be based on the different models. The bridge deck was designed to carry the traffic weight load that is there, and there's going to be maintenance requirements regardless of the whether it's closed completely to vehicle traffic because there's an elemental de degradation that occurs as well with structural bridges. So that is the exposure to the air, to aging, oxidization. Likely there will be some additional operational costs and reinvestment costs if it is carrying vehicle traffic in the very long term, but the life cycle of the asset is quite long. We do not have that analysis done. That would be a significant new piece of work. And may, may I ask whether, whether that is, well, I'll, let me put, phrase it like this through the chair. Why should we not have that data before we make the decision to open the bridge to vehicular traffic all year round? Ms. Scheer? Madam Chair, so the bridge was debated, the function of the bridge was debated very extensively through the environmental assessment project process. Ultimately, it was designed to support operations, including vehicle traffic. So anything less than that certainly can be accommodated within the intended budgets for the bridge. Whether or not there are tangible savings from removing vehicles from the bridge would be a, a very new piece of work that has not been anticipated. Uh, this is an operational discussion about what is allowed to occur in terms of traffic management. Uh, we did not go back in and say, could we have built a less robust bridge if we didn't have vehicles? It was designed for the use of vehicles as well as pedestrians and cyclists. Thank you. Follow I'll up, yield Councillor? For, I'll yield for now, yes. Okay, thank you. I will go to Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Lewis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I'll just again apologize for interrupting earlier, uh, but I wanted to make sure we had our order of operations correct there. Um, with regard to the motion uh, that's on the floor, I'm going to speak to that specifically. Um, certainly, if that's the motion that committee approves, I'm going to be supporting that at council. <clears throat> um, and I'd like to, to preface that by saying I'm not adverse to potentially revisiting uh, the operations of Blackfriars. Um, three, four, five years down the road. The reason I absolutely uh, support no change at this point in time is um, with all due respect uh, to the comments in the report about uh, the minimal impact on traffic, um, it's difficult to find a road that's open in the downtown right now. Uh, and we heard that uh, with regard to Dundas Place too and the, the pedestrian and cycling friendly environment that we're creating there. Um, we have a lot of, of road work going on, a lot of infrastructure work, and necessarily so, and important work. I, I, I don't by any means uh, want to sound like I, I don't value that work that's going on. Uh, but until the rapid transit downtown loop is finished and the rapid transit system is up and running, the construction's done and the rapid transit is running, I am not interested in taking away access point opportunities for people to come downtown. And I will say this, um, I've been doing cycling, cycling Saturdays. Uh, on Saturday, I took the opportunity to uh, bike down to the Wortley Pride. From there, I biked up to the London Bicycle Cafe opening. Uh, I biked home later, but I also took the opportunity to uh, bike across Blackfriars Bridge because I knew this issue was on the agenda uh, this week. 
Um, I put 26 kilometers on my legs on Saturday. Um, there are some spots that were definitely feeling safer than others, but I definitely did not feel unsafe on Blackfriars Bridge. Um, so, I, that, you know, I, I have to fundamentally say I, I reject the argument that staff are supposed to calculate um, unreported because if they're unreported, we don't have a way to measure them. Uh, and making assumptions on that uh, it, it is troublesome at best. So um, I, I understand that people feel uh, like it's it's pointless to report, but it is not. And so if incidents happen, the individual needs to report those if they really want that data to be considered. Um, I think that this is the right approach for now. Um, I'm not convinced that that any restriction is the right long term approach. I'm opening to listening, but I'm not opening. I'm not open to making changes right now. Um, and, and in terms of uh, long term costs, um, cost changes decades from now uh, may be uh, a reality. Uh, but that's not a reason for me to close the bridge to car traffic today. Um, if somebody wants to ask for that report to come forward in the future uh, and take a look at those when the construction is done, I'm happy to listen, um, but I'm not prepared to make a change right now. So I think the uh, motion that's on the floor is is the right direction for the moment. I uh, appreciate the councillors bringing that forward and I'll be continuing to listen uh, to what colleagues have to say. Uh, but for me, this is a uh, this is not a no, but it is a, a not now in terms of making any changes to the operations. I think the status quo is serving us best at the moment. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Ferreira next. Thank you. Um, and through you, um, I guess I'll start with uh, thanking the delegation. I know I've spoke to a few of you already, and um, and I did uh, attend that AGM last night for Blackfriars and heard what uh, everyone was saying there. Um, and uh, at the beginning, you know, I was of the opinion that I would like to see the bridge closed, and I am still of that opinion. Um, but I did say that regardless of how I feel about it, just because of um, the people that I represent, I would, I was hoping to find um, a good, clear indication from a majority of the people within the area of Blackfriars and uh, North Talbot, uh, the people who, are, who use the bridge, in my opinion, the closest or the most, because you're in the vicinity. And I was hoping maybe kind of naive of me to have those results come out, to have a clear indication on which way the bridge use of the future should go. But obviously, as you all know, um, this it's pretty split down the middle. And everyone that I've spoke to, every person that tells me I'd like to see the bridge closed, I have someone tell me I'd like to see the bridge open. And I've got that pretty much over emails, over phone, and over face-to-face -face, um, conversation. So I keep on saying that, you know, I will try to see um, what would be the best option for everybody and not just for how I feel with, with the bridge. So I, I basically have been saying that I'd like to come objectively to this decision. So I, but I will say, um, you know, um, just because that you have that decision split and it is very close and some can argue that you have a little bit more saying close the bridge than open the bridge, just considering, you know, statistical error and the sample size, it, I would say it probably is a pretty even split, which is why I did like the staff recommendation, which is a very measured approach, I thought, um, to have the bridge kind of half and half, roughly speaking, of the status of, it, of the future. And I do want to thank staff for that report um, and the conversations that I've had uh, with staff about it, because I do feel that that is the best compromise. And in the end, I, I'm hoping to find um, a good compromise. In, the way I see it right now, the safety of the bridge, um, if it is, if this motion does pass, the safety of the bridge is the main concern that I would like to see. And that's not just for you pedestrians, that's for cyclists and not just for cyclists and pedestrians, but for people who may happen to be driving on it. And the safety is a big component for me. And if we do see this motion gets defeated and we are seeing uh, more of an active transportation using the bridge, the concerns, some of the concerns that I've heard from some of the residents that live near the bridge, I would like to see those concerns addressed as well. People who may be loitering on the bridge, partying on the bridge, defacing the bridge with graffiti or whatever, I would like to see something added um, to that just to make sure that those concerns are addressed. So 
because that sample size is split, you know, I thought that the best approach would be that middle ground that staff has recommended. And I have heard arguments on the floor that, you know, we can't close off that route because we need routes downtown. But from what I see, we have Oxford and we have Riverside that are mainly uh, for vehicular traffic. And we don't have an access point for people who are using active transportation. And this is one of the first steps that I would see on kind of achieving some of the goals for our climate emergency action plan that would be good for that because we don't have that component. People don't necessarily feel safe uh, traversing that area and the bridge is the only option that they would have if we were to go to the, to the direction of closing the bridge. So in the end, if we go to this motion, again, we're not gonna have a dedicated route for cyclists or people who wanna walk. And we are still that, you know, that driver-centric city. So I feel like that should be considered um, just to, because we do have goals for the Climate Emergency Action Plan and we're not hitting those goals and it's gonna be a case by case basis on how do we manage and steer the city to achieve those goals even if we get it. And this is one of those cases and this is not the only one, there's gonna be more to come. But as we can see in this situation, it is a very difficult thing to do because we have opinions on both sides and it's been highly politicized. But in the end, I would like to see us do things that would make us achieve our climate emergency goals, the action plan's goals. And this is one component that would do that. Um, but in the end, like it's about community safety and we're not necessarily considering the community safety for people who are using active transportation, whether it's cycling or walking. And like I said before, all our routes in that area, the closest routes are dedicated to drivers. So that is my approach to this. And that's why uh, I am in the end saying I would like to see it closed. But like I said previously, you know, we are pretty split down the middle. And that's why I thought the staff recommendation, option two, was the best approach. I also would like to say, um, I've heard also from people who live near the bridge that the state, the future state and status of the bridge always being in limbo does not make you feel good. And I totally get that. You wanna know, you wanna feel that you don't have to have this topic coming up again. So I would like to the committee to, to know that a lot of individuals in that area would like to have a decision and leave it there and not change the state again in the future. Because that is something that they're always wondering, what's gonna be the status of the bridge next year? What's gonna be the status of the bridge the year before? And this has been going on and on and on and on and on. And I think it's about time that we leave this to rest. We should settle this as soon as we can. If a decision comes up in the future after construction, um, I would hope that that would be the final decision. And I'd also say that, yeah, we have construction right now and some routes are closed, but we gotta stop thinking about what's right in front of us on that short term. And we gotta start thinking about the future and we gotta start thinking about what is the, the long-term goals. And our long-term goals, as we all signed up to, is the Climate Emergency Action Plan and the targets that we reach for that. Targets that, in my opinion, are not that ambitious. They're very low. And we're not even reaching those low targets. And reasons we're not reading, being able to reach those targets is for reasons like this. Because, you know, these, these topics that come up are highly politicized and, and contended by, you know, different parties, varying parties back and forth. But I would like to just have you just kind of think about in your decision when you make this decision, because I'm not a voting member on this committee, is just think about the long-term goals. Think about your future, think about your family's future, because it is case by case by case that we're gonna have to make these decisions and we're gonna have to decide thinking of the future of London. So I would hope that you would defeat this motion and put option two which is a compromise in the middle. Um, and if you'd like to go further than that, I, I wouldn't be against that either. Um, but those, those are my comments for this. So I'm just hoping that we do realize that, you know, we don't necessarily have any dedicated um, crossings for that area. You know, we have the bridge on Oxford and then we have a bridge coming up of Black or on... Um, thank, thank you, Councillor. I'll give you another second to wrap up. I'm just saying, okay, that's, that, that, that's my, my two cents for that. So just consider, just consider our, our, what we've signed up for and consider that, and, and that's all. 
Thank you. Um, I've got uh, Councillor Pribble next, then Frank, then Stevenson. Any other councillors looking to get on the speakers list? Okay, I'll go over to Councillor Pribble. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm not going to exaggerate too much if I'm going to say that I use this bridge on a daily basis, all three as as a driver in the car, as a pedestrian, as, as a bike, bicyclist. I honestly, overall, and of course I'm not there 24 seven, I've never seen so much respect among the three as anywhere else in London on this bridge in terms of respecting all three, all three sectors that are using this bridge. I do think that it's uh, at this time, certainly, it's the best option, no doubt is number one. I'm very surprised when I'm hearing the Climate Emergency Action Plan and that we don't stand behind our word because I'm going to tell you right now, when there is a CN train going down, the only two routes to downtown are really, uh, is Talbot and this bridge, that's it. We will have Adelaide as well. I would really love to see the study to see cars idling for five to seven minutes because of the train tracks or someone going over this bridge. So in terms of the climate action plan, honestly, I feel more, even though I'm not an expert in it, in calculations, I feel actually more comfortable that I'm doing much better for my climate if I'm going 20 kilometers over an hour over this bridge than standing for five minutes waiting for the CN rail to come through. Uh, this is a this is a important, even though the, the numbers are not thousands of cars per day, uh, or tens of thousands of cars per day. This is a very important for both leisure businesses to get to downtown. Business owners they use it a lot because of the things exactly not waiting for the CN rail and traffic, and it is an important aspect. Uh, when there are special events in London, Budweiser Gardens festival. People use that as well. Guess what? Instead of having more traffic on uh, uh, on the other roads, when this was when this came up in 2017, and as it was already said, it was easing rush our traffic congestion on Oxford and the Riverside Drive. Now it's the other ones as well. We started in 2017 with a approximate cost four and a half million. We we revisited it because of the cars traffic, and we realized that it was important. Uh, uh, access to downtown. December 2018, 7.9, it ended up being, according to my research, $8.6 million, and we based it on the traffic for the cars, so we could, so we could uh, support the cars coming downtown. Uh, thank you to the fellow councillor who proposed uh, a motion for number one. If it does come to the council, I will certainly support number one, and I do think that certainly at this time, and when I say this time, as the Peter Mayor said, I, uh, I'm willing to revisit it in year, years as well, but not just based on the construction. The CN rail, we are not going to put around, the, we are not going to put around downtown. We are, going to, we are not going to take it up all the way in the air, and it is the best solution. And we are here to represent half a million Londoners, and I do believe that this is the best solution. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Before I move on to Councillor Frank, I just wanted to uh, let um, committee members know and those that are in eScribe that you can view the motion uh, on uh, eScribe. And I just want to check in with the mover and the seconder as uh, Part B, which was in the original motion, was moved into to this as well, which is that long-term study be submitted. Um, so for those that are here in the gallery and online, you can also see the motion uh, on the screen, uh, but I'll read it out as well, that the following actions be taken with respect to the long-term use of Blackfriars Bridge. A, that option one be continued with the current bridge configuration as outlined in the staff report dated June 13th, 2023 be approved. And B, the above noted recommendation from the long-term use study be submitted to the director of the environment Environmental Approvals Branch, Ontario Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, as required by the previous Environmental Assessment Review. Uh, just wanted to look to the mover and seconder. Yep, okay, thank you, and I'll go to Councillor Frank, thank you. Thank you, and thanks for having me at your committee. Um, appreciating uh, the time to come and talk. I talked lots last night, so I'll, I'll make this one much shorter. Um, but I want to thank st staff for the report and also all the people that came to delegate in the middle of the day. We really appreciate hearing from you and your time. Um, many of you are Ward 11 residents, so hello and thanks for coming. Uh, I wanted to echo Councillor Ferreira's sentiments, um, except I support option three, um, which also isn't currently on the floor, um, but I do appreciate a lot of what Council 
Councillor Frere was saying, uh, especially as the ward councillor, I think he talks to a lot of his constituents and um, is able to share some of those perspectives. Um, just wanted to add my two cents as well. So we know cars are the number one source of emissions in London um, and making space for active transportation helps reduce our emissions in that area. In regards to people worried about emissions from idling, um, the, is the issue is if they're already on the road, if people are already driving, uh, we've kind of lost that battle. Whether they're idling or moving, they are driving. Um, and the point about making active transportation options viable is so we can encourage people to make that decision before they even leave their house that they're gonna walk, bike, or roll. Um, and I think that is, is how we're trying to reduce emissions. So if they're already in their car and they're idling on Oxford or Riverside, they're creating emissions, whether they're idling for five minutes or driving around downtown. Um, also, earlier, hearing from a couple different people saying that um, having cars use this bridge would make it safer. Um, I don't personally feel that way at all. Weekly, we read news articles about people being hit or killed by vehicles. Um, I read this morning about a pedestrian being hit at Highbury and Huron and is currently in critical condition. That happened last night at 11 p.m. Three days ago, an elderly woman in an electric uh, mobile scooter was hit at Southdale and Welling or in Warncliffe by a truck who probably couldn't see her over the very large uh, front of their truck. So if we prevent one death by car, even though we discussed that there are no collisions at this intersection, um, there are collisions everywhere at every intersection in this city. If we prevent one death by car, I think that's a very worthy goal. Um, and I'm just, again, to echo Councillor Ferreira's looking into the future. Um, we're a vision zero community, and if we are trying to achieve no deaths by car, um, I think we need to uh, work on making sure we have as many pedestrian-friendly areas as possible in our community. So uh, as well as a young female walking at night, I'm more afraid of being hit by a car that can't see me than I am by somebody jumping out of the bushes and attacking. And not that that doesn't happen, um, but being hit and killed by cars happens more often in our community based on what I read, at least in the news. Um, so I just think that it's really important we provide these safe options for people who are walking and biking in, in the neighborhoods. Um, as well, the vast majority of residents from my community who've contacted me said that they want to keep the bridge to active transportation only. Um, so that is why I would be supporting option three um, at council, depending on where this goes at committee. And finally, um, there is lots of research out there that demonstrates that people who are walking and biking actually spend more money at businesses. Um, so if we want to make sure our downtown is thriving, I think we want to make sure that people who are walking and biking are, are able to get there easily and spend lots of cash downtown because that is also what I hope will happen. So just a couple of my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll go to Councillor Stevenson next. Thank you. I just quickly wanted to add my support for option one for all of the reasons previously stated. I'd like to see the downtown be as accessible for all Londoners. And I thank Councillor McAllister for putting this forward. If it passes, I will be happy to support at council. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Trosso. I think this will be like a closing uh, statement in, in opposition through the chair. I think it's one thing for this city council and the previous city council to, to take steps like declaring a climate emergency and taking subsidiary steps after that. This is one of the first tests that we have to, to, to determine whether or not we have the political will to carry that forward. And I can count as well as the next person. So I, I think, I think um, we have a lot of work to do, and if this motion passes, um, then that would effectively take option three off the table. But if this motion does pass, I will have a few amendments that I'd like to put on before we, before we um, vote on the main motion regarding the implementation of this. Because in the, in the unfortunate situation that we go with option one, I think there are, are many additional things that need to happen first. So um, I'm just flagging that. I, I, would, I, I, I don't know if there are any undecided um, voters, voters here, but uh, I would urge that you vote this um, measure down and uh, allow us to continue with the discussion on, uh, on, on item three. And this, is, this is not a popularity contest. This is not counting submissions. Yeah, we could do it that way. But the more courageous way for us, for us to be operating is for us to do what we think is right 
and for us to do what we think is in the interest of safety. And that's why I'll be voting no. Uh, thank you. Um, Councillor Van Muurbergen, go ahead. Um, we, we didn't spend uh, $8 million to produce a standalone footbridge. Thank you. Okay, uh, looking to uh, members of committee, um, Councillor Trosso, I heard you say that you may have some amendments that you're looking at. Should option one pass, I think that there um, are amendments that um, I would want to make to that. Um, I'm not sure procedurally how I would do that. Would I do that um, after it passes, before we get to the uh, main motion, or should it be done now? Because there's really no option one on the table. The option one's on the table, but it hasn't been passed yet. Yeah, so the, the motion that's on the table is before you, and if you're looking to amend it, uh, that would be something that you would need to bring forward. With, with, without, this is going to sound like a lawyer's talk, but without waiving my objections to uh, option, option one, which I will vote against at council, I, I think if we're going to pass this, we should put a, a clause in there asking, asking for further study regarding the costs. And I'm not, uh, maybe this should be referred to the budget, or maybe it should be referred to, um, maybe it should refer back to staff. And I understand that we can't come up with exact figures, but it's, it's indisputable that there are going to be additional maintenance costs and additional other compliance costs if we allow vehicular access on this, on this bridge. And I think that those who are um, asking for option one right now, especially those who purport to be fiscally conservative, should be asking for that kind of information now. And I would move that. Uh, okay, thank you, Councilor Trasso. So you're looking to move an amendment to the original motion or do you want to wait until council? I'll make it now because that wouldn't preclude me from bringing it up at council. Okay, so you're looking, one second. Okay, just one sec. Do you have some language for your amendment? Oh, sorry, Council or Deputy Mayor Lewis. Sorry, did you? Uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair, uh, uh, perhaps before the Council uh, suggests an amendment, um, I, I have perhaps a, a procedural. Uh, suggestion as as well as a uh, question through our staff. Um, first, I would suggest that procedurally, uh, because we are making a decision right now, there is no future report coming back. Like if council passes option one, there is no future report back with a cost analysis. Um, but further to that, uh, through you, uh, I would ask our staff uh, what, if anything, can they anticipate uh, the cost, the staff time, uh, the length of time they would need to produce such uh, a cost benefit analysis. Thank you. Do you uh, want to ask that, that question of staff? Because my understanding was Councillor yes. Trusso was looking for a multi-year budget request potentially as well. So, so that would then so, help to address that. Yes. So that, that's why I'm asking this because procedurally, um, Asking for a report from staff on a cost analysis on a decided matter, which if this motion were to pass would be a decided matter, uh, would not be uh, in keeping with a multi-year budget business case ask. So I'm wondering if if Ms. Chair, through you, Chair, uh, might be able to provide us some commentary on, on what the scope 
uh, would be for her staff in terms of what the counselor is proposing and how she would even report back uh, on a matter that may be decided. I could see if the counselor suggested any future reports on the state of Blackfriars include a cost analysis, but we are making, uh, committee's making a decision now and council may be making a decided matter of operations. So there would be no report back point. Okay, um, I'll go to Ms. Shear for comment, go ahead. So Madam Chair, to do this work, we would have to hire a consultant. This is not a standard sort of um, bridge operational work. We would need to get somebody to model the incremental difference of the loading of this bridge with vehicles and, or with active modes over its entire life cycle, and then compare that against the required maintenance based on um, those two scenarios. So I'm thinking we're looking at a consulting commission, likely in the range of about $50,000, and I would suspect the earliest we could report back would be, I'd say, about this time next year. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Deputy Mayor Lewis, did you have follow-up? <clears throat> yes, so uh, I would just suggest then through you, Madam Chair, if it helps procedurally, um, that if the Councillor wished to still pursue an amendment on this, uh, that you would need a clause asking staff uh, to report back on the long-term operational costs of Blackfriars Bridge um, to a future CWC meeting. Uh, I think that's the only way you can procedurally land a request um, on on a cost analysis when a matter is being decided. So just just sharing that from a process thought for your uh, uh, to, to hopefully be helpful on that. Thank you. That is helpful. Um, so I'll go back to the the uh, councillor looking to move an amendment. Uh, councillor Trasso, is that what your intention was? Uh, the deputy mayor put it very well. And uh, Ms. Shear put it, put it very well. And yeah, that's a lot. It's another consultant and it's another period of time. But I think it's, uh, I think for us to leave this, to leave this matter in the long run with, with, with some certainty that we've done the right thing, these are, these are things that we should know. I would prefer to get this information before we open the bridge, but this, the status quo is sort of what it is. And, um, I'm willing to live with that, but I would I would like to see this report because I think in the long run, and if we play this out over 10, 20, 30 years, we'll see, and maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think the council might see that there are significant operational costs. So it's not just a question of public safety. It's not just a question of promoting cycling, but it's also a question of fiscal responsibility. So uh, I, would, I would like to... Um, uh, Take, take the deputy mayor's um, advice and use, use the language that he suggested. Okay, thank you. Before we draft that language up, uh, do you have a seconder for your amendment? I'm not seeing a seconder for that. Councillor McAllister. Um, I'd like to see the language first because I'm not actually sure what the uh, councillor is requesting. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Van Meerwerken, go ahead. Well, the, um, this bridge has been uh, worked on for, to my knowledge, at least eight years. Uh, it, has, it has budget approval through that time. Uh, this is nothing new here. We're engaging in wheel spinning, and it's... it's it doesn't make any sense. This was a functioning bridge with two-way traffic before its remediation. Uh, now it's gone to one-way traffic. Uh, the, the intention always was to have vehicular traffic. Uh, if, if some choose to want to go with a footbridge, you know, that's their choice. But to, to sit here and get into all these amendments uh, which serve no purpose um, is not productive.
Okay, uh, committee members, we are trying to draft the amendment uh, for that Councillor Trosso has uh, put forward. So um, it's it's there in eScribe. Uh, Councillor Lewis did provide some additional language, so we're just trying to capture that. Um, so I'll let Cal Councillor uh, Trosso and McAllister take a look at that to see if you want to second that uh, as an amendment to the original motion. Um, just make sure it reflects what you're looking to do. Councilor McAllister. Um, thank you, and through the chair, question back to staff. Um, as Ms. Shear noted, so this would be going to a third party to do uh, an evaluation, um, or as this reads right now, it, directing the city staff to report back, is this a report back telling us what the consultancy would include and the fee, or is it going to initiate? Because uh, my, my issue is if we're initiating it, um, you know, I, I have reservations about that, but if it's a report that you will bring back to us, um, including the cost and what would be involved, um, that's something I could support. But um, I, I would like to know if, if the cost is going to be hitting us now or if this is just a report to, to look into that. Thank you. Uh, Madam, Chair. Madam Chair, as I read, the staff would be directed to undertake the work with a consultant. I will note there is no budget available to do that work this year. We would have to put in a multi-year budget business case to request the funding for the consultant to undertake this work starting upon budget approval in 2024. Thank you. And, and so you mentioned that would be a budget request in 2024 for a report back in. Uh, Madam Chair, the earliest we would be done would be sometime later next year because we would not have budget approval until the multi-year budget is approved by council, which is expected to be early March of next year, at which point we would go out for to hire a consultant to build these models to do this analysis, and we would provide a report back, a, I suspect an information report, late in 2024 at the earliest. Thank you. Councillor McAllister. Um, thank you, and through you, um, I, I won't be seconding then. Just um, I, I, I don't think, I, I think... If this is something the councillor wants to bring to council um, to vote on as a whole, then that's fine. But um, I won't be supporting that to, to go through committee. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so at this time, I don't believe I have a seconder for uh, an amendment to the original motion. Um, is there any other debate or comment on the original motion before we vote? Okay, seeing no uh, further comment, um, if you again go back to your current item on in eScribe for those committee members uh, here, you can um, see the original motion. It's listed as three, uh, moved and seconded. Um, it was moved by Councillor McAllister, seconded by P Councillor Van Muurbergen, and it's on your screen as A and B, and I'll open that to vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to one. Thank you. And I, I want to take a moment to uh, thank the public that uh, participated today in the public participation meeting and those that reached out uh, via email. Um, we are very lucky to have such an engaged community uh, in these conversations. And I want to say thanks to staff for the work that was done uh, in this staff report as well. Um, before we wrap up this item, we do have to uh, deal with item, motion four. Um, so I'm looking for a mover and a seconder. Um, and this is just related to uh, the public participation meeting, the speakers listed that were received, and then the additional added agenda uh, communication from Mr. Fife Miller um, and Sprawl H. Tallman, Tallman and L. Durham as well with respect to this matter were received as well. Uh, looking for a mover and a seconder. Councillor Van Muurbergen, Councillor Cuddy, thank you, and we'll open that for vote.
closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Okay, thank you. Uh, committee members, we're on to item number four, which is items for direction and the core area parking initiative. Uh, I understand staff are looking, oh, sorry, Councillor, do you want to jump in? Okay, thank you. Uh, I understand that staff are looking to provide a brief uh, overview of this report and then uh, we'll entertain discussion with the committee. Okay, would you like staff to present first and then uh, you can no. put the motion forward? No, I'd like to make my point first. Okay, Councilor Trasso, go ahead. And this, this is uh, through, through the chair directed to staff. Um, we have another very heavy meeting coming up at four o'clock that many, many of us intend to um, be, be, be at, including, uh, including visitors. And I have no interest in impeding the progress of the parking study. Um, there, I think there's going to be, I'm going to have quite a bit to say about it. I've done a lot of research on this. I have a lot of questions and I probably will have some, uh, depending on how the uh, conversation goes, I will probably have some, uh, some amendments. My question to the chair to staff is, would, would, would any serious damage be done if we deferred this to our next meeting, which would likely be shorter? It's not typical for, for civic works committees to go, to go this long. So thank you, Councilor Trasso. So one thing I will inform you of is that the next cycle of CWC, we have a very heavy agenda coming forward with items related to our Green Bin programs, some things that are on the deferred matters list. So I just want to make sure that we aren't kicking this can further down and then we have a very packed meeting ahead of us. Um, so uh, I'm sure, Ms. Shearer, if you want to speak to that at all, go ahead. I certainly will defer to Mr. Mathers on the timing of this particular report. But yes, the July meeting of Civic Works is, uh, I think we're looking in the range of 18 to 20 reports, including some very meaty topics related to uh, the Green Bin program and another number of other large initiatives. In Thank the, you. In, in which case, through the chair and, and through the clerk, it, it, seem, it just seems to me as a member of this committee who takes the, the work of this committee very seriously that we might want to consider spreading this out a little bit and scheduling another um, meet, meeting, meeting, given that. I do not want to rush through the parking thing, but I don't want to put that on another crowded agenda where, where it um, will be, be colliding with things like the green bin. So I, perhaps this committee needs to spread itself out a little bit. Could we do that? Uh, thank you. Okay, I hear what you're saying, uh, Councillor. At this time, we do have staff prepared to uh, speak to the, the parking strategy. Um, and, uh, you know, it does dovetail well with some of the discussions that were had last night at PEC. Um, so I do think that, that it's important for us to consider. Um, but I'll go to Mr. Mathers to see if he has any comment, and then I'll go to Deputy Mayor Lewis. Through the chair, we are, of course, prepared to speak today, but it's in councils and committee's hands to whether they want to um, have us speak and, and bring this forward today. Thank you. Um, and uh, Deputy Mayor Lewis, and then uh, I'll go back to Councilor Trasso. Now, Councilor Trasso, do you have amendments prepared and, and ready to go related to? I, I want, I want... No. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Deputy Mayor Lewis next. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So respectfully, I, I'm, I'm here as a visiting committee member. Uh, I've canceled two scheduled meetings this afternoon in part to be here for this item. Um, members of the public are aware that this item is on the agenda and we have an hour and a half before the next committee meeting begins. So um, yes, these are important topics. Um, however, we need to stick to our, our published agendas as much as possible. And I would really discourage committee from trying to uh, refer this to a future meeting uh, on the basis of there's not enough time. Uh, we've had this report since last week. Um, if there was a desire to talk to staff to prepare amendments, uh, there's been time to do that. So I think that the committee should proceed with its uh, published scheduled agenda. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, I will move to Mr. Mathers for a brief presentation and then to committee for conversation debate around uh, the core parking, area parking initiative. Go ahead. 
through the chair. Thank you very much. So uh, we're here today to provide you a report and uh, some background on uh, several initiatives that uh, could move forward with uh, to support parking within the downtown. Um, we have, uh, of course, this has been a topic that's been been very much um, uh, a part of our council strategic plan discussions. It's come through through our query of vacancy discussions as well. So we provided uh, several initiatives that could um, help to support some of the parking and what we've heard from the community um, uh, moving forward. Uh, those four initiatives include extending the temporary free parking in the downtown. This is an initiative that came through the core area action plan. So we'd be suggesting moving it, uh, allowing it to proceed until Q1 2024. It's been a very popular program and we've heard from our downtown BIAs and uh, and the Old East Village that it's been very popular to be, help them to uh, recover from COVID and uh, to deal with some of the construction impacts. Uh, we also have an item here that, that discusses creating a, uh, making some changes to our bylaws to allow for bulk uh, parking, reserve parking. as part of our core area vacancy uh, reduction study. The second most uh, frequent item that was discussed by the uh, in folks we engaged with uh, was on reserve parking and the need for that type of parking. Uh, we also have an item here to reinitiate the procurement process on the 185 Queens Avenue. Uh, this was an, actually a core area action item, so we're bringing that back forward uh, post COVID. And then also the final item is uh, looking at undertaking a downtown parking strategy and providing some uh, cost information related to that and making a suggestion that be considered part of the multi-year budget process. Uh, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer those. Thank you. Um, so before we begin that uh, discussion, I'm looking for any councillors that would like to put the uh, recommendation from staff forward so that we have something to frame our conversation. Councillor Van Muurbergen, looking for a seconder. Uh, Councillor McAllister, thank you. And so that is on the floor and I will open up for questions from council, or from committee members, sorry. Uh, discussion? Councillor Chasso, go ahead. Through the chair, um, th thank, thank you very much for this report. This is a complicated report in that there are a couple of different moving elements to it. And I, and I think um, there's, already been this, there's already been some discussion on the, uh, the free parking promotion. Um, I'm going to ask you to explain um, a little bit more about what bulk parking is, and I'm going to um, ask you to talk a little bit more about the um, 185 Queens Queens Avenue because um, what what exactly are we um, under undertaking here? After you answer those, after you try to address those questions, I'll I'll have some uh, other broader policy questions. Thank you. And through the chair, okay, uh, Mr. Mathers, please go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, through the chair, so uh, I'll speak first to the uh, the bulk discounted parking item. So one of the items that we heard and, uh, and continue to hear through that core area of vacancy is that it's been difficult to um, have uh, to be able to attract some commercial tenants to the city of London because of a lack or a perceived lack of of uh, reserve parking. So this is parking for a business. If they want to come to London, they need to be able to secure a certain number of spots um, for their employees. Um, one item that we're trying to provide for within this with, with, to address that issue is that we do have uh, parking lots throughout the core of the city that are underutilized. And this, there would be an opportunity to make some changes to our bylaws that would allow us to be able to secure parking in some of those less utilized lots um, on, at, a, at a different rate, so at a reduced rate than the, the typical um, daily rate to be able to provide for parking to allow some of these businesses to come to London. The long-term strategy would be that ideally if we can get these uh, businesses to come to London that they will see how um, uh, how wonderful our new tra rapid transit system is going to be and that they, we can actually over time reduce the need for these additional um, reserve parking spots. But um, what we're really seeing is just a need to try to get people in London and then ideally they'll have, uh, have staff that'll be able to see that there's a value to not have, uh, have it to drive to the core in the long term. So that's the first initiative. So it really is just looking at making a change to our bylaw. The uh, second item is related to uh, reinitiating the procurement process for 180, uh, 185 Queens Avenue. Um, 
I provided a little bit of the background of the history that I wasn't actually involved with, but there was a, proc a procurement process that was initiated. This is currently a City of London uh, parking area, and um, the thought was to bring this, this parcel forward uh, initially for a parking structure uh, and to go out to the marketplace to see if a, market, uh, a new parking structure could be constructed. Um, with and then that parking structure be run and financed and um, also operated by the city moving forward with some other type of, of uh, a commercial venture to be able to provide the financing for it. Uh, what we're suggesting is that uh, we kind of turn the uh, look at a different um, way to be able to apply for the to apply um, a procurement process for this parcel. Take a look at uh, providing a par to providing this parcel to the open marketplace, uh, and then through a procurement process, look at what's the best um, opportunity for the city to be able to get out of this parcel. So, can we look at uh, a procurement process that would actually provide some um, some scoring, looking at the amount of uh, parking spots to be able to replace what's there, looking at the number of additional parking spots for reserve parking in the future, and then also looking at the, uh, the quantity of residential units that be constructed and also affordable housing. And, and the city's contribution towards that effort would then be a, uh, um, the, the actual land parcel to be able to move this forward. So it kind of aligns to a number of our different goals. One is being able to provide and replace the parking that would be in this area, um, provide uh, more housing in the downtown, and affordable housing as part of this initiative, and the city's contribution would then be uh, the actual parcel itself. Um, if you have any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you. Councillor, follow up? Y yes, uh, th th thank you, um, through, through the chair. Um, what's, there, there are things that are not in here that I would like to see in here. Um, and I'd like, I'd like you to um, maybe just explain to me where they're going to go, because I think there are things that we agree on, but I, I would prefer to see it explicitly in, in, this, in, this, in, this, um, in, this, in this motion, but may, may, maybe it's being subsumed someplace else. Um, so the two I'd like to start with is like, number one, better parking design. Because e e e even though we may have differences ab about, about how many surface parking lots we, we should have, I think there's general agreement that we could do a much better job in terms of uh, designing them to um, ameliorate some of the harsh environmental effects of just all, all cement all the time. Um, and I don't, see, I don't see anything addressing better parking design. Um, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking at a very interesting report. It's from the Canadian Urban Institute. And this was actually uh, referred to in one, of the, in one of the news stories about this. And it's called Rethinking Surface Parking for Pedestrian-Friendly Office Development. And one, one, one of their five strategies, and the one that I think is very relevant here today, is um, better, better parking design, which can reduce the land area required to support parking, as well as uh, create some aesthetic and ecological uh, contributions. Could you, could you address that? Thank you, uh, to Mr. the chair, Mathers. this is very uh, a very timely discussion. It actually, was a, uh, something that was also suggested and uh, discussed at, at planning committee last night. Um, whenever we see a temporary uh, zoning request for the extension for parking in, in the core as well. So what we've been trying to do is when these items do come up and, and people are looking at changing the zoning on a property, look for a plan of how they're going to address that property in the future, um, ideally for a redevelopment opportunity, but also um, if, if that's not the case, to try to make it so, so it's a, a, a much more uh, um, beneficial site from an environmental perspective. So we are looking at that from, um, in that area. Um, as far as uh, the actual parking, the other parking lots across the downtown, that could be something that uh, if it's council's uh, direction that we can take a look at as far as how, how we can actually make some of those sites um, uh, conform to a better urban design. Uh, it is something as far as, as the London plan, it's it highly valued as, as ensuring that uh, any kind of, uh, of structure or urban space uh, is something that is beneficial both to the environment and for the people that live there. Okay, so um, am, am I, through the chair, am I, am I hearing that this is something that is not precluded by passing this measure today and it's, uh, it's gonna be discussed? Okay, so the next issue, which I think is a really big one, 
is reduce demand for parking. I mean, I don't, I don't think we can have a, a good discussion about our long-term parking strategy if we don't start with the premise that ideally we would like to reduce the demand for, for parking. And I think there are obvious ways of doing that that we're working on in terms of our uh, tra tra transit and cycling and active transportation and, uh, and other things. But um, <clears throat> we, we, we play a role in, in reducing the demand for, for, for parking. But th th there's, a, there's, a strong, there's a strong car culture there's a strong car culture in this town. And what goes along with the strong car culture is, that ex is, is an expectation that parking be free or low cost and very, very close to, uh, to, where, to where you're shopping. And um, I, I think that those are all parts of a, um, of a parking strategy that I, I think should be explicitly, um, should be explicitly addressed. Could, could, you, could, you, could you talk to that? Uh, Ms. Shear? Uh, Madam Chair, I'm, I'll jump in on that one because I think uh, the council raises a really good point that the context of the downtown parking strategy needs to be done in the context of our other transportation network improvements. So the proposal that staff would, would put forward as per this report is that it would actually follow after the mobility master plan is done. So that information related to other transportation investments can inform the downtown parking strategy update. Uh, th th thank you. Um, is, is the parking strategy considered part of the, um, is the parking strategy considered part of the um, purview of the mobility master plan? Ms. Shear? So, Madam Chair, uh, it is not part of the purview. It is a subsequent study that would be updated afterwards, and that's traditionally how it's done so that one can co-inform the other. There'll be a number of studies that come out of the Mobility Master Plan over the years of the, that plan is, uh, is sort of in effect because it's a very long-term strategy. So updating the downtown parking strategy would be a logical companion study after that work is done. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'll yield to some other um, councillors, including visiting um, councillors. Have we given any thought to creating a parking authority, a municipal parking authority that, that, is, that is owned and controlled by the municipality and which becomes sort of a separate fund, of, f f f fund which will make expenditures, presumably float the banters, uh, presumably uh, enter into uh, partnerships with other developers, and presumably uh, collect and uh, hold and invest um, proceeds. And this is a long, this is a very long range issue. Uh, through the thank chair. You, Mr. Mathers. Yeah, so, so through the chair. So that hasn't been something that's been explored for the, um, for the long term. This has been an in-house in uh, operation. We have within my group, the actual, uh, the folks that are, are operating the parking and uh, from a day-to-day -day basis. And then on the, on the transportation side in, in Kelly's group, we have the folks that, that are providing the, um, the policy and the, uh, the long-term direction as well. So for the mo for most part, that's always been an in-house activity. So any other type of a change to, to look at uh, being provided in a uh, different way would have to be a direction of council. Thank you. Uh, I have Councillor Van Muurberg and then I'll go to Deputy Mayor Lewis. Well, I'm happy to support uh, this recommendation. I think um, staff has done a very good job on laying this out. Uh, the parking is absolutely essential and the, and, the, and the amount of parking available essential for the economic operation and the well-being of the downtown core. If we don't have that, it just adds further pressure on the withering of the core. And I think we all know that the core is sitting in kind of a precarious position, um, not only with the businesses that are located there, but people who choose to live and want to live in the downtown. They want to be in a healthy neighborhood. And that's all part and parcel of attracting more people, uh, not only Londoners, but visitors to come to the core, shop in the core, be entertained in the core, but if they don't find parking, they won't go to the core. So this is, again, fundamental. Um, I'm, I'm happy to support it. We do live in a car culture, but not to fear. The electric car is just down the road, 
and it has no emissions and will be saved from climate change. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will go to Deputy Mayor Lewis and then to Councillor Frank and then back uh, check in with others. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I appreciate you recognizing me on this. I want to speak as quickly as I can uh, to four of the five uh, recommendations uh, that are on the floor right now. I think the staff report being received doesn't need any speaking to. That's an obvious one. Um, uh, I do support bringing forward a business case as part of the multi-year budget. Um, you and uh, Mr. Mathers both alluded to some of the discussion that happened last night at the Planning and Environment Committee. And I would agree with Councillor Trussell that uh, some more um, uh, climate and, and pedestrian friendly design of surface level parking lots is definitely something we need to consider as we allow uh, any surface level parking lot to continue. Uh, but I think what's really important here is the clause B and the uh, procurement process for 185 Queens Ave. Um, this is not a surface parking. This is a parking garage proposal to replace a surface parking lot. And it's not just a parking garage. Uh, the proposal is for mixed use development that would include affordable and market unit um, rental accommodations. I think it's really, really critical, colleagues, that you all support this. Um, and I also want to caution that we cannot presume to micromanage the procurement process. Um, we have to allow our staff. Uh, to design a, an RFP that goes out uh, and then will be evaluated. So we can't narrow the window to the point where we get no uh, valid applications. Uh, different applicants are likely to bring different proposals to the table. Uh, and when that happens, when staff evaluates the, the submission, if, for example, there are 20 EV charging stations, um, that will be considered as a community benefit. Um, that's outlined in the London plan, so staff can consider it that way. If there are other amenities, uh, you know, rooftop green space, for example, uh, that can be considered a community benefit under the London plan, and so that can influence the, the point system of an RFP. Uh, how many spaces are going to be public versus reserved uh, for office space versus reserved for tenants? Um, the more public spaces we get, that can also award uh, extra points in the RFP. But we have to let uh, applications come in and let staff evaluate which ones are the best. So I would really encourage colleagues not to try and amend Clause B to start putting in a lot of extra criteria because we have to see, uh, we have to give a broad opportunity for applicants to submit a proposal uh, and not actually put ourselves in a position uh, where we're, we're potentially compromising the process in a way that applicants could claim that we were unfair under the basis of the London plan. Um, so I really encourage colleagues, especially to move forward part B. We have been talking about the need for a parking garage in the zone three, four area of the downtown uh, since before Councillor Van Meerbergen was a rookie councillor. And that was a while ago. So um, I, I really hope we can get that one moved forward. Um, bringing forward a, a parking bylaw amendment so that we can provide bulk discount um, to spaces for office use. That is the number one barrier to attracting tenants to downtown offices right now is the lack of reserved parking for employees. We're not talking about storefront parking uh, for someone who's running into Ubercool or Heroes or Vintage Dugout uh, to do 15, 20 minutes of shopping and leave. We're talking about people who are going to be downtown from that eight to four, nine to five sort of shift every day, and they need to have that reserved parking. And when landlords can't provide that, offices go elsewhere. And if we truly are going to continue to support the London plan policies that, that require uh, offices over 5,000 square meters to be located in the core, we have to recognize that parking is part of that. Otherwise, they will go to St. Thomas, they will go to Woodstock, they will go to other communities nearby, they will not come to London. And that, uh, excuse me while I put my cat on the ground. Uh, so that's really, really necessary. We, we cannot mix the front door customer parking mentality that Councillor Trussell referenced with the need for reserve parking uh, for office tenants if we want to deal with that core area vacancy rate. Uh, I support letting staff uh, bring forward a business case for the downtown parking strategy. Uh, that will be informed by the master mobility plan. 
And when that business case comes forward, we will have an opportunity to uh, ask staff to consider some additional components of that, but let's let them develop the business case first before we start um, determining what we would like to see in it, if it's enough, if it's not enough. So all in all, I, I think there are four excellent recommendations here. I did want to, through you, Madam Chair, though, ask a question specific to Clause C, which is the extended temporary fee uh, with the core area promo code. Because I did have an opportunity to talk to Mr. Mathers about this one-on-one, uh, -on -one. Uh, the numbers look uh, very high in the report in terms of the amount of revenue we're foregoing. And I just wonder if he can take a moment through you, Madam Chair, to explain how the way the Honk app is tracking use, and, and I told him when I met with him, guilty as charged, I'm one of the people who does this, uh, Honk uh, app users are just booking their two hours, whether they're using the two hours or not, and that is skewing some of our numbers. So I'm wondering through you if Mr. Mathers can put a little bit of context around the numbers related to the Honk core use. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mathers. Uh, through the chair. So as I uh, highlighted in the report, uh, it has been a very successful program with being used over 200,000 times. So the actual direct cost of that program is approximately $50,000 because there's a transaction fee that you have to pay every time. However, there's also the loss of revenue that you would get from that. So there's a table in the report that kind of highlights that revenue. Um, and it should be looked at in considering a couple of different components. One is that uh, this is a promotion, so it's possible that not all of those people would have actually come to the core if it wasn't available. Um, and then as well is that we've, um, we know that just by looking at the data, that when people go and use the code, they always put in two hours. So um, even if they were going to go and just do a five minute uh, run in, run in out of, of a, a building, they, they know that uh, they, they're just going to go and put in that full amount, which uh, two hours is $5, so it, it racks up fairly quickly. So, um, and again, this is this is foregone revenue. It's a parking lot, so it would either be have a certain number of cars in it or, or less. So uh, um, just want that to be part of the understanding as far as these values. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank did you, you have anything else, Deputy Mayor Lewis? Go ahead. No, the, I was going to say that's very helpful. And I think that the other thing to, to uh, highlight is that um, they may seem like foregone revenues, uh, but if if a consumer like me has purchased two hours and only uses half an hour, um, in the absence of that other hour and a half being used, that spot may well sit vacant as well. So it's no revenue, uh, not foregone revenue. So I think it's really important to put an asterisk beside uh, those numbers in terms of the foregone revenue because they're not quite as cut and dry as they might appear to be. And unfortunately, that's just the uh, the shortcoming of, of how the system tracks users and how users interact with the system themselves, uh, because that two hours is, is what default shows up on the app. So when you click that core promo, um, unless you want to go through a couple more steps to reduce your time, that's the time you get. So I think that's really important. Uh, I'm just going to uh, wrap up there and, and just thank staff for what is a very important but detailed report and I know we've heard lots uh, with regard to the CIPs last night as well uh, about how important this is about how important it is to get uh, office spaces filled uh, about getting retail spaces filled and getting people into the downtown and as as much as we would uh, like to encourage alternate modes of transportation uh, and while I may disagree slightly with Councillor Van Bergen because EV vehicles still create a manufacturing uh, footprint uh, but certainly once they're up and running, they're not producing the same uh, GHG footprint. But I, I do agree that the car is not going away, but the sooner it goes electric, the better. Um, and so I, we are going to continue to have a need for parking spots. And I think all of these components uh, take a balanced approach to addressing that in a responsible way. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Frank and then looking for any other speakers. Thank you, and thanks for letting me speak again to this. Um, I want to do a quick summary similar to how Deputy Mayor uh, Lewis did, but um, I think that this was uh, a really good set of recommendations from staff. I do have a couple feelings that are outside of that, but uh, overall, I was really happy to see this. Um, I think option A, to have um, business case brought forward to do an update makes a lot of sense, especially since we are using that map where you have the, the six zones, and that I think was 2014 was the last update. 
updated one. I, I'm trying to remember, 2017. So I think things have changed. It would be nice to get an updated map to, to reference, um, as well as other information about downtown parking. Um, part B, I think this sounds very exciting and innovative and forward thinking um, and a much better use of space than the current surface lot parking that we have at 185 Queens. And I look forward to seeing what comes back. I think we were very excited to see um, the property at Lorne Ave uh, brought forward, which we uh, have seen now. The Habitat for Humanity is going to be building, I think, 14 affordable um, housing uh, projects there. Um, and I think that being able to take city land and transform it into something that meets a bunch of our needs is really exciting. Um, part C, I'm actually hoping um, there might be a councillor that would like to drop this. Uh, I tried to have this... Um, during uh, my budget uh, motion at SPPC two weeks ago, and I took it off because I knew that this was coming to this committee. Um, so I'm uh, going to see if perhaps Councillor Trossow might want to put a motion on the floor to just drop Part C, um, because I don't think that we need to have more parking downtown or more taxpayer subsidized parking downtown. Um, I do agree with the comments earlier from Councillor Van Meerbergen that people downtown want to live in a prosperous and safe community and more people visiting downtown want to visit a great community that they feel safe and, and connected to. Um, but I believe in order to do that, we need to be addressing the social issues downtown. And to do that, we need money and spending hundreds of thousands at minimum on taxpayer subsidized parking downtown takes away money in our budget that we could be using on social housing issues um, to uh, Deputy Mayor Lewis's point. Um, even if the 200,000 users last year were only to spend 30 minutes, that would be $250,000. So if that, I don't think that's accurate. I bet you some people are spending an hour, some people are spending two, some people are spending 30. So at minimum, we spent 300,000 last year in taxpayer money subsidizing parking spaces during the day downtown. Um, I'd rather spend that $300,000 on, on housing issues. Um, so that's kind of why I'd like to see Part C dropped, because I, I just want to see a better use of, of the money that we're spending. Um, and then Part D, I also think that sounds very interesting. I would be interested, I'm, I'm not going to try and see if someone will make a motion, but maybe perhaps if there's um, a restriction where for reserve parking in city parking lots at a bulk discounted rate, um, if uh, people own more than 50% of the downtown, there's actually the opposite, not bulk discounted, but bulk upsale rate, um, just to try and incentivize people to use their space more appropriately. Um, I'd be interested in that, but I'm, I'm not going to try and make a motion to that. Uh, and then just the last comment I want to add is um, I do own an electric vehicle. I love it. It's uh, it's a great ride. It's super quiet, super smooth. Um, but it does take uh, up the same amount of space as a gas vehicle, so meaning we're investing in roads and parking spaces. Um, so it does use a lot of car infrastructure, which are emission heavy. It also produces emissions because our electrical grid right now is currently, and I just checked, using 18% of our electrical grid is natural gas powered right now. Um, you can look at gridwatch.ca to check it out. Uh, usually that would be around 7%, but this provincial government has been increasing our gas use. So my once only 7% gas using uh, electric vehicle is now 18%. So it's quite frustrating for, for me. Um, plus, as, as Deputy Mayor Lewis mentioned, to build an electric vehicle, there's huge uh, emission fo footprint and embodied emissions. So um, car infrastructure, whether it's electric vehicle or gas, still is very emission heavy. So all to say, appreciate the work that staff have done. Would love to see if uh, Council Trasso would drop item C and put that on the floor. Um, otherwise, I look forward to seeing this again at Council. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go to Councillor McAllister and then Councillor Trasso. <clears throat> um, thank you. And through the chair, um, <clears throat> I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, I do think the report was um, um, very well outlined, and I appreciate all the work that went into it on staff's part. Um, I'm speaking specifically to um, B, and <clears throat> as <laughs> we had a very um, lively conversation uh, yesterday in terms of incentives for affordable housing, uh, specifically in the core, and I, I, I'm fully in favor of the mixed usage. Uh, I think that's a great idea, and I fully endorse that. Um, I'm just wondering if staff could speak maybe in terms of their confidence that we would be able to find uh, such a partnership. I know we have struggled um, you know, in terms of we, we don't have the bonusing anymore, and I know there were issues with that, but in terms of trying to get the, the affordable units that we desperately do need, um, in terms of working with uh, applicants, um, do we feel confident, or is this going to be one of those situations where it's we received a bunch of applicants, but we're going to have to drop it because no one pitched that? 
Mr. Mathers. Through the chair, so I think the one thing that 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 uh, an applicant or someone that wants wants to submit a proposal on this has going for them is that they bring provided land for for no cost, right? So that will offset anything that that, that they'll be looking at as far as additional costs for affordable that affordable housing piece. Also, um, what we're going to be this will be part of the criteria that we develop in developing the uh, the terms of reference for this uh, this request for proposal is. Uh, providing like a weighting and scaling and points for different aspects of the application. So the number of affordable units would be the piece where we would be able to rank the different proposals. And uh, I think the benefit in the approach that we would have um, with this compared to like a bonusing provision is that um, that would be left up to the recommendation, left up to the actual applicant um, to be able to submit how many units they think um, they could make work in this site. And then council will have the opportunity to decide whether they want to go with that application. So there's a, there's a lot of flexibility in here and it really would come down to um, the applicant, what they're looking at, at doing with this site and their own business plans for the site as well. Follow up? Yep. Okay, Councilor Trasso. One question I'll ask to the chair um, regarding um, C is, is there a sunset on that or, or, is, or is that persistent until it's pulled? And does that have to be uh, renewed in the, in the upcoming budget? Do you mean for part C for to end the first quarter of 2024? When, when that first quarter of 2024 is over, it would have to be reapproved through the multi-year budget. Thank you, Mr. Mather. Through the chair, so this initiative was a temporary initiative through the Quarry Action Plan. It was it initially was just to cover construction-related costs and uh, an event um, and special events. During COVID, it transitioned to a completely uh, subsidized program for to. Um, to allow for businesses to cover during post-COVID. Um, what we're making a suggestion in, in this report is that um, that program that, uh, that was temporary in nature would conclude as of the end of Q1 2024 and, and not continue. Okay, um, th Council. thank you. Thank you for, um, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I would be more comfortable through the chair with, with part A if, if, if I included some of the things that I spoke about before. Um, however, I got, I got the distinct impression from you that it's not necessary and you're gonna do that anyway and there'll be the opportunity to raise these, the, the, these points. Is, is that correct? Mr. Mathers? Through the chair, that that is correct. Um, be happy to take any of the materials that, that you've uh, you've taken a look at recently. I think that would be helpful in the other work that we're doing, um, looking at whenever we have a, a new zoning application for temporary zoning relating to parking lots and what our initiatives would be in moving forward on those. Councilor, yeah, through the chair, yes, I, I will I will forward to you the uh, Canadian Urban Institute. Um, pamphlet because it's um, I, I found it very helpful in terms of framing some uh, some issues here I have one final question I'm not going to be making any um, I'm not going to be making any amendments at this point but I do have one question um, do does the city of London as a municipality have the opportunity to enact a differential fee structure in uh, in in, in uh, long-term parking or in street parking or or any parking based on the size of the vehicle and I'm, I'm thinking about the contrast between a small subcompact and um, some of the very very large um, I'm not sure what to call them SU SUVs utility trucks thank you like similar to what they did in Montreal yep uh, mr. Mathers uh, through the chair, um, uh, I'm going to have uh, Mr. Katolek just provide some feedback on some, some other initiatives. Um, the one thing, uh, just so that we're conscious of as well, just on the implementation side, um, we do have, uh, um, we don't have staff at most of these parking lots, so being able to decipher between the different unit sizes, unless the actual is a smaller, um, actual smaller parking spot would be difficult, but I'll let Mr. Katolek speak to it. Thank you, Mr. Katola, go ahead. Yes, through the chair, not wanting to repeat what Mr. Mader said, but um, a lot of uh, 
payment is made through apps or through uh, credit cards uh, at the master meters. Uh, very few people are carrying two knees and quarters and putting money in the, uh, in the standalone meters these days. We do have uh, discounted parking for veterans, so that's identified by their license plates. But uh, we have not done any research on whether it be possible uh, or legal to charge different rates depending on the type of car you have, whether it's size, how many cylinders, or whether it's uh, EV or not. I should also add that we do have uh, designated spots for EV charging, and we do have uh, uh, penalties through our AMPS program if there is a car parked in an EV spot that is not an EV car. Thank you. Uh, Councillor? Okay. Uh, seeing no further speakers at this time, I'll look to call the vote. Um, and that'll be open for you, Scribe. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Okay, thank you. We're on to item five, deferred matters and additional business. We have item 5.1, the deferred matters list in front of you to be received today. Are there, uh, I'm looking for a mover and seconder to receive that list and then we'll, we'll take questions and comments. Uh, Councillor Cuddy, Councillor McAllister, and any questions or comments on the deferred matters list? Okay, just a comment, I did mention that there are a number of items coming to Civic Works in July, and some of those are related to the deferred matters list, so those will be uh, brought forward. And thank you to uh, staff for providing that list to us. I'll open that for vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Thank you. We'll move on to 5.2. This was an added from the Community Advisory Committee, uh, the Environmental Stewardship and Action Community Advisory Committee. Um, I want to thank uh, the chair for raising concerns around, uh, some concerns around membership and vacancy. You can see that in the attached. And again, this is to be received. Looking for a mover and a seconder. Councillor Cuddy, Councillor McAllister, thank you. And any questions or comments before we open the vote? Seeing none, we'll open up for voting. Close the vote. The motion carries five to zero. Thank you. And with that, we're on to item six, motion to adjourn. I'm looking for a mover and a seconder. Councillor Van Rierbergen, Councillor McAllister, thank you very much. And I'll do a vote by hand. Thank you so much. I want to thank everyone for their patience. Thank you to staff for your time, and uh, we'll see you at the next one.